a lot of people stay in quiet desperation because they get talked out of the thing that deep down inside they know to be true. And they're going to think, what's wrong with you? Like, aren't you grateful enough? Why would you leave? So why did young Cody think that she should have gotten married to this man? And did young Cody know that she shouldn't have at some point? And the answer is... So Cody, you were married to a guy who actually wanted you to be a stay-at-home wife. You had like the fancy cars, the white picket fence, but you had these massive dreams to work and travel the world. So you decided to actually speak up and leave. And as a result, you're now happily married, own 26 companies and invested in like 100 more. Now, most of us would have actually stayed in that relationship in just quiet desperation, feeling bad or shamed or even a bitch for actually leaving. How the hell... Did you stop people pleasing? Start putting yourself first and not worry about what everyone else thought of you. It took me years and I really had to do it completely by myself. I think a lot of people stay in quiet desperation because they share with other people and they get talked out of the thing that deep down inside they know to be true. And so it's almost the opposite of what we're told in things like AA or when we're having difficulties, tell somebody else, let your community help you. For me, it was, I don't want to tell anybody else because they see this perfect thing and they're going to think, what's wrong with you? Like, aren't you grateful enough? Why would you leave? And so it was a solo mission that I knew that I had to take. My parents knew about it uh, the day before I told him that I was going to get a divorce and not a moment sooner. None of my friends knew about it uh, except one that I went to live and stay with uh, that night when I left. And um, I think the moment where I felt that I could not live another day in that marriage was when I looked at, we had two friends that were married 10 years older than us. We went on a group trip together, the four of us, and they were you know, wealthier than we were. They had kids together. They were sort of 10 years in the, the future for us. And I remember you know, my husband at the time looking at me and saying like, you know, one day that'll be us. And I just was horrified. <laughs> and I thought, there's nothing I want less than that. And so if I could project myself into the future and that is what 10 years looks like, if I don't make a move today, I will end up at a place where somebody else has become the architect of my life instead of myself. And so that moment changed everything. And now, whenever I'm in those difficult moments, I try to project forward. Do I want this thing that I'm striving for? Hmm, let me look at somebody else who has it. And if I don't want their life, the things that are around them, the type of happiness that I see exuding from them, then I'm gonna probably stop chasing that. God, that really hit me, that projection thing. Um, but there's a big chasm yeah. between that moment of like, oh my God, dear Lord, I don't want that. Mm -hmm. And then processing, but what are other people gonna say? What's my mum mm. gonna say? How am I gonna leave this guy? Like, to your point, mm. like people are gonna think I'm crazy. So how, what did that actually look like then in the steps of you realizing that and then you actually leaving? Because I think again, some people right now may be hearing, oh my God, that feels like me, but there's no way I can leave. Like that, yeah. even just the mentality of I can't leave. Yeah. You should pick the person who will be the bully for you. So mm -hmm. in this scenario, I called my dad and I said, I want to take you on a little trip. We went to a dude ranch in, uh, in Northern Arizona. And uh, I went for two days and I said, I want it to just be the two of us. And I want a father daughter trip. And my dad can be a very tough man. And so we went and the first night I sat him down and said, I've already made a difficult decision. I will not be changing my mind on this decision, but I need a lot of support. And I'm gonna set out the exact expectations of how you can be there for me if you want to. Are you open to having that conversation? And he of course said, yes, what is it? Are you okay? And I said, I'm, I'm getting divorced. Uh, I'm leaving my husband. I want you to tell mom because I don't wanna have that first conversation with her. And here's what I think will make this doable and easy for me. And I was really clear on what I wanted. And I had written it down in a journal. I was like, if I'm gonna do this, how could I make this less miserable for myself? What would be the steps where instead of this being something that could derail me, might be something that could propel me? And we sat down that night and I basically said, I want you to talk to mom 
uh, instead of me. I want, uh, I don't want anybody to ask me why, or are you sure, or these things that are questions for you and not for me. I'm very firm in my convictions. If after a certain period of time, we're past the divorce, you know, I've moved out, we've figured that out, you wanna have those conversations, I'll let you know when I'm ready. Are you open to doing that? And so twice he got to say yes or no, open or not, and twice I got to say, here's the way that I actually need to be supported. I think most of the times in life, we don't get the support we want because we don't actually know what support we want. We've never taken the moment to sit and think, I'm gonna do this big, awful thing. How could I have somebody else help me do it? And could I be really clear on what the expectations would look like for support? And so maybe give yourself that option. What I've found is that those few people in your life that can be the bullies for you or that can be the support system for you, they don't know how to support you because they're not you. And so the golden rule actually becomes the worst things possible, which is maybe they wanna sit up, drink wine and cry all night. And all I wanna do is move past it. And then maybe I have the breakdown as soon as I'm done with it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. Oh my God, I've got so many questions. Okay, so how did you have such strong conviction of what you wanted? Because as you're breaking mm -hmm. it down, I'm like, that's so powerful. But I think again, where do people get stuck? It's that sometimes they don't even know what support looks like, what support they need. Did you write down like your fears? Like, oh, if someone asks me, I really worry that this is gonna break me. Yeah, I, uh, I've kept a journal since I was really little. Mm. And the journal is usually goals-based. My one, three, five, ten year goals, like we're all taught to Even do. Even when you were a kid. Oh, yeah. Oh, I kind of love yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. <gasps> I want a Barbie. Um, <laughs> you know? Um, but uh, so I've always kept goals in my journal, but I had never done anti goals before. And I don't know where the word came up, but at some point when I was in business, I heard this term anti goal, which is if I accomplish X, Y, and Z, uh, that's incredible, but what would that make that terrible? And um, so if you think about it, you know, you start a new business and you're like, I want to start this new business. I want to make a million dollars a year and I want to do it in my area of passion design. OK, great. Well, what would make that miserable? Well, I have to work 90 hour weeks to do it. Uh, my you know, passion now becomes something that I feel like I have to do as opposed to I get to do. And so then you can create your goals in a way um, that fits what you really want as opposed to what you think you want, which is mimetic desire as opposed to intrinsic desire, what's inside of you as opposed to what keeping up with the Joneses maybe. Mm -hmm. And so I just wrote it down. I said, I'm really scared to do this. I also think if I don't do this, I'm going to be miserable the rest of my life. So how could, how could I help myself make this less awful? And I wrote down all the things that scared me, like uh, my mom crying, uh, me disappointing my mom, um, you know, your friends thinking that you're selfish. Oh, what if they think they're in, that I, you know, had infidelity? What if they think that it was my fault and not his fault? Am I going to even explain faults? What would that look like? Mm -hmm. And so I wrote down all of this stuff. And then I have this good friend, Stacy, and she um, always, she, she taught me something really cool, which was that it takes actually a lot of strength to allow somebody to support you. You know, if you think about it, you're probably similar weight on my shoulders, I can handle it, don't worry about it, I got this. And there's actually something pretty beautiful in allowing a few other people to be support systems for you. And so I had never done that before, I would never ask to stay at a friend's house, I would always stay at a hotel, I would never lean. And this was one of those times that I thought, okay, if I'm gonna be able to lean on two people, I wanna be really clear on what that looks like. And now I do that for anything that scares me. Wow, what do you think you would have done if your dad didn't respond in the way that he did. If he was just like, no, I'm not gonna tell your mom and what do you do, right? And he just completely ignores your request. So I had that scenario plan. People these days talk a lot about manifesting. I think about if then statements. Mm. So instead of a manifest, I hope that this happens. I go, well, I hope that X happens, but if Y happens instead, then I'm going to take this action. So everything just becomes like a little pyramid of like, if this, then that, if this, then that, if this, then that. And when you do that, I basically said, okay, my dad might say, no, you need to tell your mother. This is, this is a, you know, this is a pivotal moment for you. I don't feel comfortable telling her. All of these things he could have said as response. And what I had prepared, didn't have to say was, um, that doesn't work for me, period. Silence. It's uncomfortable. When we just go period silence, that doesn't work for me. Often what you find is the other person will go, well, what does work for you? 
And then I would repeat back the other thing. What would work for me is this. And then they might come back and push on you again, at which point I would say something like, there's two ways for you to be involved. The first way is what I talked to you about. And the second way is we can talk after I've done the divorce and I've moved through it. And you guys don't have to be there for me. So what I'm actually saying is there's only one way for you to support me, but I'm giving you an option or an out of just not being involved. And, you know, I think what I realize in life is you, you can either have difficult conversations up front or impossible conversations at the back end. And so I will take difficult to avoid the impossible. But it took years for me to become confident enough to even do that thing because we project out. We think it's going to be worse than it is. Mm. And that's why you go, OK, it might be. But if then, if then, if then. And typically, I've never had more than two if thens go sideways. So the third, fourth thing isn't necessary. Mm. We all think the world's going to be we're, we're chicken littles thinking this guy's going to follow all of us. Uh -huh. I love that so much. Um so it took you three, uh, multiple years to build that confidence then. Yeah. What steps did you have to take to build that confidence, to get to the point where you were able to then realize that life didn't suit you, then yeah. speak up and then move out? One of the best things that happens to people young, I believe, is getting put in jobs and positions where you are told no continuously. Building up an armor of no, of you're not good enough, of you know this doesn't work, really makes a lot of things easier in life. And so for me, I was in finance and I was doing sales. So I was during the 2008 financial crisis doing investment sales to people who were losing everything at that moment. You could imagine me calling and saying, you know, hey, I want you to put through this order and I want you to come into this IPO. And people are like, what is wrong with you? Like lose my phone number for eternity. The world is ending. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I did that for years and years and years. And so once you have failure so repeatedly, you realize that you're not going to die, right? People telling you no, people telling you that you're not good enough. It hurts at first. And then at some point it stops hurting. You know, you look at little young boys, right? And the way they speak to each other, like, you know, you're so ugly. That girl's never going to say yes when you ask her out. Women, we don't have that as much. We're like, honey, you're beautiful. You're perfect. You're great. Right. And so we don't build up this armor of nose. And I think as a woman, like if I was single, you know what I'd go do? I'd go to a bar and I would try to talk to as many men as I could. And I would try to get turned out as many times as I could in person. Because then guess what? Tinder swiping, who cares? You know, a date doesn't go riot, who cares? Because you've built up an armor that shows that that has nothing to do with you as a human and everything to do with, you just have to take a few more swings. Can I push you a little on this yeah. one? Because I, I so hear what you're saying. Yeah. The problem is, I think that maybe you think that because you have a strong mindset, there are other people that That's they right. hear no, they get rejected and they yeah. really do believe it's about them. That's and right. then what happens happens is instead of it building that armor, they actually believe it. And now they're, they, they're, they are smaller. They feel smaller. Their confidence yeah. gets more damaged, not improve. Yeah. I think you're right. And it never feels good to fail or get told no. I'm not sure it ever changes for any of us. Um, but there's really only two options in life, right? The first option is that you can assume positive outcomes continuously and be disappointed. And the second is that you can have difficult things happen to you in life and realize that the universe only gives them to you because they think the universe thinks you can handle it. You know, I have we have a mutual friend, Layla. And we were talking about her before. And we have this thing that we talk about called Tuesdays. Um, and so basically we'll text each other uh, all the impossible things happening for us right now. So family things, losing a bunch of money, deals going sideways, people getting fired. And then at the end, we kind of make this just like just another Tuesday. And the, the reason why is because we think we have a belief. We have chosen to believe that every single problem that comes before me means that I'm capable of handling it. Now, I don't feel like that every single day, but if a problem happens and I start to say, huh, this means that I must be able to fix something, that the universe thinks I can handle this problem, then I become more and more appreciative of problems because they take me to the next level. I don't know how you start, but I do know that if you could just take that tiny frame, which is something bad happened, huh, I expect that to happen because that's life. And two, this bad thing that happened, that must mean I could, I could figure this out. If you could change your mindset to that, 
then everything that happens to you is that old Tony Robbinsism. It's really happening for, for you. Yeah, I love that. So I want to actually go back to you. You've heard you talk about like the golden handcuffs. Mm, yeah. So in these moments where you've got like a beautiful house, like I said, you've got the cars. It, it seems like growing up, right, at least for me, I was taught that that, that means that you've you've made it, yeah. right? You've got the lovely husband that loves you. You've got the cars, you've got, right? Like the, the, the things that you think you should have. Yeah. And so they, they're the golden handcuffs because now you feel like you can't leave. Mm -hmm. And so did you ever worry about what was on the other side of leaving? And then how did you then, as you're nodding, how did you then actually decide or figure out that the unknown was better than the golden handcuffs that you were in? few things. One, what you guys do here on this podcast is incredibly important because I truly believe you can't be what you can't see. And it is much easier to travel a path that has already been worn. And so when you're walking in the woods, you, you typically, you know where to go because there's some sort of footpath that somebody else has traveled before you. And I know that most problems that I have had or that you have had they've existed for millennia. You know, we humans have these repetitive cycles over and over again. And so why would I try to recreate the wheel entirely and figure this out by myself? Mm. I did sort of the same thing I would do in business, which is I went and got a coach who specialized in divorce, who was a woman that I liked. Mm. Mm. She was a therapist. I paid her 50 bucks an hour and I went and talked to her about, this is how I feel about divorce. I think afterwards, nobody ever may date me again. I think I might be completely alone. Maybe I'll be childless. Maybe I'll never have sex again. You know, all the crazy stories in your head. Everybody's gonna hate me. I'm gonna lose all my friends. And it took somebody else who had an unbiased third party opinion, who was also divorced, who was also an expert to say, I wanna play this back to you. Let me repeat to you the words that you just said. Does that seem reasonable? Like you, you're young, you already have friends, you know, you have one husband that loves you. Could you find another one, do you think? And her repeating my words back to me made me realize, oh yeah, that's a little ridiculous. That's not a reasonable thing to think. And she was a pro, right? So I got to get, I got to push off my fears onto somebody else's profession. And that helped me a ton. So that was step one. Step two, she said something to me that was really powerful then that I'll never forget, which is uh, the power of place. She said, the second that you leave, you're going to feel like you turned a house into a home. You turned a, you know, relationship into a marriage. Um, you know, you left behind your dog, which was heartbreaking for me at the time. And uh, you're going to feel completely untethered. And humans were meant to root. And so she's like, I want you to do one thing when you leave. I want you to go get the most comfortable, cozy, perfect place for you. It doesn't have to be somewhere crazy. Mine was a little townhouse surrounded by trees. And she's like, I want you to decorate it. I want you to nest in it because there is power in having your place. And that was some of the best advice I ever got. I still remember that little townhouse. Um, I almost want to buy it back and like give it to other women because there was something so powerful about knowing I can make my own house a home. It doesn't have to be this one that I was living in before. Oh, that's so strong, the power of place. Yeah. Um, and I've also heard you say you just have to be willing to lose everything. And I just yeah. have a quote of yours. I had to lose everything, including the person I was, to become the person I wanted to be. Mm. How do you then actually do that? Because in those moments where I can just imagine, right, you're moving, so you're, you're saying the power of place, the power of place, or you're repeating it to you, right? You know, but I'm sure, I'm guessing there were moments of tears and... Oh, yeah. Crest being feeling crestfallen. Did you have any doubts? Like, were there any regrets in those moments? Um, because in your quote, right, it's like the idea of losing who you are can be so damn scary. Like the identity of being a wife, the identity, you know, even though you've come through it in so many beautiful ways, um, take me through that transition. Oh yeah, I mean, it was awful. I uh, the worst part for me was actually. Um, they say that you go to therapy, uh, men go to therapy to stay and women go to therapy to leave. So when I, so we went to therapy and at some point, you know, it just, we came, it was a culmination. And, uh, and I remember coming home that day and it was dark at night and I had to tell him that I was leaving and wanted to divorce and I was going to leave that night. Like literally that night? That night. So you tell him and then you're ready to leave. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, my bad. And big, big dude. 
And I remember him looking at me. And um, when I said those words, he just crumbled, you know, to the ground crying. Now, I wanted to be divorced from the man, but I'm not a heartless monster. And it was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. I'll never forget that moment. And I'll probably never stop having some shame or guilt surrounding it because I had promised to say forever to somebody. And then I broke that promise. And that meant something to me then. And so when I left that night, I remember going over to my uh, friend's place. I was stayed in her guest house and fucking Eat, Pray, Love came on the TV. <laughs> And there's this scene in Eat, Pray, Love where uh, Julia Roberts like is on the ground in the bathroom. You remember that yeah, scene? Yeah. And God's like, get up, you know, get up. And I'm just watching it like this, like basic bitch, sad bastard in bed, just bawling, you know, and watching Julia Roberts on the floor. <laughs> and uh, And I remember kind of like laughing at that moment, but just crying. And I was like, what we're going to do is we're just going to allow ourselves a night of tears. It's okay. Like, I typically am not a big crier. I just do what the good immigrant thing is, which is like, take all your feelings, shove them down inside, you know, <laughs> like never let them out. And so, uh, so I remember just saying like, we're just going to cry tonight. And so I had that like big therapeutic cry of a night. It was tough. And then when I woke up in the morning, I was like, I feel a little bit better. And I think there's probably some sun on the other side of this, mm -hmm. but there are many moments where I felt really sad and heartbroken, even though it was my decision. And it's okay if you're on either side of that equation. The wild thing is, however many years it is later, eight years or nine years or whatever, um, you know, he's way happier. Like married, kid, great with the person he probably should be. And I'm with the person that I should be. And look at all the shame and guilt I had for allowing another human to live the life that they were supposed to and being brave enough to say, this isn't working for either one of us. Mm -hmm. And so what if the story is actually that the thing you're so scared to do is the exact thing you're supposed to do? And what if you could let that sink in for a second and actually believe it and then realize that in that difficult decision, you are avoiding an impossible decision later on. Oh, that's so strong. So why do you think you still have shame and guilt now? What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. Mm, you know, there are moments in life that I think you, you honor by looking back on and saying, why did young Cody think that she should have gotten married? To this man and did young Cody know that she shouldn't have at some point and the answer? answer is yes really you knew before oh you yeah I actually think and I'd be curious your take that um we women we have this like inner little good girl inside of us and this little good girl kind of does what she's told and she uh it plays nice and sometimes she's just a wallflower. And it's a voice that was told to us by society, by our mothers, whoever, that, that, you know, just be quiet, be nice, be a good little girl. And we keep that with us for a long time. And in my life, most of the bad decisions that I've made, the regrets that I have, are when that little girl inside of me said like, hey, excuse me, um, actually, I feel a little something. I don't trust this person. I don't think we should follow through for this. And I went and I talked to somebody else about it. And either they talked me out of it or I talked myself into it. And if you really can think about it, we've talked about gut before. Most of us have that gut inside of us that we just, we bury or we don't listen to or we don't believe. And I actually think you don't need more advice typically. You need to listen to your fucking gut. Mm -hmm. And I knew. And so that's why I have some shame is like, it's not so much shame as like, remember, remember, Cody, like, you know, nobody else does. Nobody else has to live your life. You have to deal with the repercussions of your actions. So why not be the one responsible for making them? Yeah. Oh, God, that's so powerful. And I totally know what you mean about that little girl voice uh, or the good girl voice, I yeah. should say. And I think of myself now instead of because I, I, 
I try really, like, because I've had so many health issues, I try not to carry any guilt or shame about anything. Yeah. And so now I kind of look back in moments where I was like, I, I probably should have made a different decision. And I just go, I just take inventory. Mm. And I was like, okay, what was my body telling me? How do I now use that as a sign so that then the next time that comes up, I can go, oh, remember, remember you found that before? And so yeah. now I can go, thank you for teaching me now in my adulthood so that I don't make that same mistake again. So good. Um, but do you think that that it becomes because you said either like other people are convincing you or you're convincing yourself, that becomes louder than the little girl that's trying to warn you? Oh, yeah. It's so easy to get talked into or talked out of the things that you actually should do with your life. In fact, in my opinion, that's why we're where we're at in society today is because all of us are listening to all of the other voices that are telling us what to do. You know, we're we're lost in our social media scroll nonstop because the algorithms are actually made specifically to steal our attention. Mm -hmm. And probably because we're living lives that don't really align with what we want out of them. So we want the distraction. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I think that most of our lives, unless we grab it and we twist it out and we pull it really hard are created by somebody else mm. because most of our, our lives were taught, you know, you sit in school and they tell you what to think, not how could you think for yourself. And when we're young as kids, it's, hey, don't act out in this manner or another. And it only takes me seeing a few of my girlfriends who lived lives that they thought they should uh, and never woke up for it, from it, for me to realize that that is not what we want to do as women. Mm. We have to listen to this and do less of this. Yeah, God, there's so many people with the shoulds, right? Where oh. it's like, especially if you come from a cultural background or yeah. like, you know, very traditional, there's the expectations that can be put on you. Um, you know, I, I ended up, you know, being a stay at home wife for eight years to Tom and yeah. that was the last thing I wanted. But I just got in the habitual motion and then had the belief that that's where I'd end up anyway because that's what I was told as a kid. You know, from like all the subliminal messages, like I would fall on the floor, like if I'd ride a bike and I'd fall off the bike and I'd scrape my knee. Um, my grandmother would come running up to me. She's like, oh, it's okay. You're going to be okay by the time you get married. Like that was her reassurance. Like, don't worry. Because like a marriage is, that was like the end goal. And so that, imagine that to like a four-year-old or a six-year-old little Lisa, and you get that subliminal message all the time. Of course you end up in a life that maybe you didn't ask or want um, because you're, you're being told that you should. And then that's why I really wanted to start on your story about how the hell you broke out of your marriage with the white picket fence and stuff, because there, there are so many people listening now that never broke out and they're, they're 20 years, 30 years in, and now they're like, holy shit, like, now what do I do? And so that pivot, that the, the catalyst for someone to realize, stop doing the shoulds. How do I take my power back? I'm leaning into it so much because it doesn't matter what life, like if you're in the corporate world and you all you've ever wanted to be is a mother with like a bunch of children. I think even now people are worried about making that pivot because society says as a woman, you should be an entrepreneur or you should have your own yeah. business. And so now they're feeling guilty about changing their lives. And so this is why I love hearing your tools and tactics because no matter what life if it is, if you can get started, if you can build that confidence to take your power back and really make that shift. Now, could you imagine what we women could do? Oh, a hundred percent. So we were talking about it before. I used to think that tactics were what you want, but what I didn't realize is that if I didn't believe in me, then it didn't matter if you gave me all the steps. All right. I just wouldn't listen. I'd yeah. black out. And so I think it's really important if you're feeling in one of these stuck situations, whatever that is, it could be divorce, it could be your job, trying to listen to the stuff that makes you believe in you again. And that is a forever journey. I mean, I have this, what I call my Bible, but um, basically it's in my Evernote and I've had it for, I can't even imagine how many years now, um, but it's every single quote I hear or read that inspires me. And so, um, when I get down or when I feel like I'm a little lost, I go back and I read through it. Um, and so I read, you know, there was one I was reading the other day that I just added that I loved, which is, ugh, I can't remember who it is, so somebody can tell us online, so I'm not plagiarizing. But um, she said, when I get to the end of my life, I hope that I won't have just lived the width of it, 
but also the length of it. Mm. And I was like, I love that. Just the visual of, you know, a life lived shallow at the very top as, a to, as opposed to a life that could have been lived this big. And so I'll, I'll sort of wear those quotes, like a little bit of armor. Anytime I'm going to have a difficult decision, you know, can you go and can you read the words of those who are stronger than you and steal their strength? And that really helps me. I love that. And there's something actually that you said um, earlier about, you know, whether you're leaving or um, leaving a job. Um, you talk about the exit tax to freedom. Oh, yeah. So talk to me about that. I found this so freaking powerful. And again, I'm really trying to think like, what are the things that get us stuck? And then how do we get out? I think it people worry about like having to pay the tax, basically. My father actually told me this when I was getting divorced. Um, I was concerned about the actual monetary cost. And, uh, and I was going to have to leave a lot of money on the table because he was fighting me. And I remember I talked about this with my dad and I was, I was very stressed financially. I thought maybe I wouldn't be able to stand on my own two feet afterwards. And my dad looked at me and he said, um, whenever you choose freedom, there's an exit tax. And he's like, just consider this your tax. And for some reason that resonated with me because I thought, well, when I make money each year, and I pay the government some sort of tax. It doesn't cripple me for the next year. It's just a toll. It is a toll you will pay on the highway to freedom. And I think that's a really powerful thing to realize. Like, I know there's going to be a price and I'm going to pay it. And then what's wild is what's going to happen to you. I can pretty much guarantee is you are going to get on the other side and all you're going to realize all the energy you were pouring into this thing that didn't serve you is going to be unleashed to your next thing. So now I've made 10 times or 100 times the amount of money that I did previously to date. You know, I'm in a relationship that I love with a man that I adore. You know, I have friends who support me, even though I lost pretty much every single friend that I had wow. past divorce. I kept one, two. Uh, they're married. And uh, and I couldn't ask for anything better. And yet, if you would have told me that back then, I wouldn't have believed you. But again, perhaps it's just flipping those questions. What if it becomes easier, better, more incredible, and richer on the other side of this impossible? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with losing those friends? <laughs> um, one, sometimes you don't have a choice. So what are you going to do? Chase people who don't want to be friends with you? Oftentimes, I think we do that. You know, we're like, hey, what about me? What about me? And at some point, I just thought, if you don't check in on me, support my businesses, you know, engage your comment with my stuff, um, call me to invite me to things. If you are not an active participant in my life, then at best, you're a voyeur and at worst, you're a hater. And I don't really have room for either one of those two things. And so if that's where you're at, then I wish you well. Do you really wish them well? Yeah, I do. I do. Because they. I really think that each of these people served me. Even though, mm. you know, my ex, there are many reasons why I got that divorce that I don't think were my fault. But man, I'm really thankful for him. And I really do wish him well. Because I don't want to leave behind a trail of dead bodies, you know. I would rather leave behind a trail of humans who are a little better off. And maybe they're not going to be alongside me anymore, but in the past behind me, they're growing at their own pace. And that's pretty incredible. I think that's super healthy. I just know that for me, I think it would be hard for me to kind of, especially if I built my friendships and they mm. kind of basically chose him over me, yeah. it would make me start to question that relationship that I had with them in the first place. And then I think that part of me, at least in that moment, would maybe spiral and be like, oh my God, was it all fake? Were they just with me because of my husband or because of the dynamic? Yeah. Well, what if they were, I suppose, is the question yeah. that I asked you. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think I would then identify, because I love going backwards in time, right? And identify what were the things that maybe there were flags that now I can take with me into my next friendships that I can now make sure that they're much more genuine and that it's way more deeper than just a surface level of, you know, maybe where you live or who you're married to. Totally. I think, you know, we're sitting in Hollywood right? A place where many people are friends with many people because of the things that they have or the people that they are, right? And my husband and I have this line we like to say, which is we like to choose sides. And so um, in this day and age, there are so many people that don't want to choose a side. You know, they want to be politically correct everywhere. They want to um, choose a side after they kind of have seen how the dust settles, right? 
And my husband and I don't believe that. Like, if you are one of our chosen few, we will, we will choose your side and even to our detriment. And so I think, you know, he was a special forces military. And so he meant that literally, you know, as opposed to figuratively, oh, yeah. but you know, he was okay with violent action on a side that he believed was right. And so that to me separates the type of humans I want to be with now. So even, you know, when we had everything going on with, you know, what was happening over the last couple of years and, you know, we were worried about what if our friends, what if we all have differing opinions on the stuff that's happening? And what we realized is whatever our stance is going to be, we're going to say it and we're going to stand by it. And uh, people that choose to support us for that, great. And people who choose to not to will note, you know? And, uh, and so to your point, it's that constant inventory of like, what is the level of our friendship? And it's okay to have acquaintances. There are many people that I'm like, of course, I'll help you to this degree mm -hmm. um, and being really honest about those who those people are. But again, I think I go back to I knew like I knew in my gut if you have friends right now where when you get together with them, you talk about people instead of ideas or instead of um, inspiration. You know, if you have people in your life that are always telling you stuff that's a little gnarly about others, like, you know, they're not going to be there for you. And so it's how aware of your relationships are you? And at that point, I was not aware. I was keeping up with the Joneses, you know, real housewives of, of Dallas. And that's, <laughs> that's not me. I was in a situation fairly recently where that happened. Uh, and I literally just got up and walked out. Oh, good for you. I was like, I, I don't want to shame anyone. I'm not here to shame. If they want to do them, they want to gossip. Like, again, I don't think that that's my place to tell them what to do. Because, totally. again, everyone needs to live their own life. But I was like, I cannot be a part of this. And so literally in the middle of the conversation, I just went whoop, whoop. And I went out and I texted my friend. And I said, please let me know when this conversation's over and I'll come back in. Oh, good for you. But I was like, I cannot be a part of this conversation. That was just important to me. But that took time. I was going to say, yeah. And, and like, what is it? Is it just a muscle that we build that you hear a few of those and you stop speaking first. No, it probably yeah, is. Yeah. It's like a stair step, right? Exactly. Yeah. A hundred percent. Because once upon a time, I would have engaged just to try and fit in. Me too. And even if I didn't necessarily believe it, I'd be like, oh my God, yeah. Yeah. You know, because I was like, <laughs> I don't want to be the only one, like the odd one out. Totally. And But that was my insecurity. Yeah. And then it became to your point of when you're building your confidence, when you're building that strength muscle, you're like, next time I'm just not going to engage. Right. right. And I just tell myself, like, how am I going to act next time? And to your point, exactly how you do it's like okay you're gonna say this you're gonna do this and so I would like next time you just you don't chime in Lisa you just sit there in silence yeah. and I sat there in silence and I still didn't feel great yeah and so I was like okay next time Lisa you're just gonna walk out be polite but just walk out yeah. and so I just made a promise to myself that the next time I found myself in that situation that I would just walk out and I did and I was very proud of myself actually that I didn't totally. engage um but I didn't need to tell anybody how I felt that was also another thing and even now I'm like I would have held it exactly the same way I don't feel like I'm the person um people don't need to start shaming other people based on the way that they live totally um I think and, that's so powerful but when you what's interesting though is when you're around dynamics as you start to change you start to grow you start to put out boundaries there's a lot of people that will start to be resistant mm -hmm. um and they don't like your growth yes and I've heard I got a great quote of yours where you said the person I have become is not who the people I love loved and I had to move past that so talk to me about how the hell you move past it, especially when there are people in your life. Like when it's friends, I think it may be a little easier because yeah. you can distance yourself. You can have like yeah. one type of relationship with them and another type of relationship, you know, with your, your girlfriends, another type of relationship with your business girlfriends. Like you can have that. But when it's family, when you grow and you realize, oh shit, like they love the old me. How do you then move past it, not take on that responsibility and make sure that it doesn't hold you where you are? So smart. Um, one is realizing uh, you may change, but most people will not change. And if you realize that, then you will stop trying to get people to understand your standpoint and instead try to get people to move out of your way. And so mm -hmm. I thought about it like, um, you know, family, let's say. Say you have family that wants you to do X, Y, Z certain thing. Old Cody would say, no, you don't understand. This is why you should do it this way. Like, why don't you get it? Here's my perspective. I would convince. I'm in, I want to make you understand mode. 
I flipped the script and got to, I want you to get out of my way mode, which basically means I don't want your mind to change. If you're happy where you're at, more power to you. I just don't want you to bother me on my path to change. And so that for me was something I started calling smile and do it anyway, which basically <laughs> meant uh, when people, when my mom, for instance, would say, you know, are you sure about that decision? Is that the right thing you should be doing? I would just listen to whatever she said, largely not comment, smile, nod in agreement and go about my path. Mm -hmm. Because for the most part, for people that you can't cut out of your life or you don't want to, you trying to change their perspective is going to be like trying to turn a Democrat into a Republican. It doesn't work. Vice versa. Right. And so if you realize that, why would you expend one of the most valuable things that we can never get back, which is our time trying to do something that will never work? Instead, try to get this belief, which I had at some point, that your actions in the life you live will be the biggest way to change, change people's mentality as opposed to any words you can say. Mm -hmm. And so what happened years later is after I got divorced and I made change and I started my whole business, my mom now will say, you getting divorced was the bravest thing I've ever seen. Wow. She would have never said that in the beginning. It was way too hard. She cried more than I did. But now she, my life has changed her mentality in a way that my words never could have. And that was a big change for me to realize. Can I ask you, do you think that that has to do though with the fact that now you are successful and now remarried and in a great relationship? Like what if you didn't have the career you have now, yeah. you didn't marry the man that you have now, do you think that she still would feel like that? And the reason why I ask yeah. is I try to play the devil's advocate That's where great. you've got the parent that is crying or, you know, oh my God, what have you done to your life? Yeah. Um, and it's beautiful now. Like that story's so gorgeous. But what if that hadn't happened? Well, there's many things that I don't have that I know they wish for me. Children, right? Age old thing wish we had kids, you know, wish that I would spend more time with the family, wish that I would work less, typical mm -hmm. things, all because they love me. And, uh, and yet that doesn't make me happy. And so I suppose your happiness is way more important than your success. So I have this material success and I have this marriage that from the outside looks good. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes I want to murder him too. Love, right. like love it's him, but we all, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. And, uh, and so I think, um, you know, you also can't expect every parent to come around. Mm -hmm. You know that. Like we, my husband's parents, for instance, his dad's very different. You know, he's a, he's a very old school man that will never be happy unless Chris lives the life that he wants him to live. And I think he'll go to his deathbed like that. And Chris just has to live with the fact that his father will never give him the, you know, good job, son, pat on the back, despite being a Navy SEAL and, you know, like cream of the crop, right? And so um, he's had to have his own journey on that. So I don't think you have to have this beautiful little loop. Mm -hmm. You just have to have your progression and get comfortable with the smile, nod and do it anyway. Yeah. Oh my God. So do you remind yourself that in those moments? Oh, like, do God, you yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Because it must be hard. I mean, it, it, my dad's the same. I mean, he, he accepts my life now. Yeah. But even, I mean, I told him that I didn't want children, uh, what was it, maybe nine years ago now, maybe even 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Two weeks ago, I'm speaking to him and he's in, he's in Cyprus with his family. And of course, all of them have grandkids and all oh, of them are yeah. like great grandkids. Yeah. And he's like, I don't even have one grandkid. And I was like, oh God, here we go. At you. <laughs> yeah, like, and, and going but to your point about like, why would we try and convince people? I think it's because, especially when it's people in our life, we really do want to be accepted. Going back to where we yeah. even started, the people pleasing, yeah. right? Whether it's ingrained in me or not, I want my dad to be proud of me and I want yeah. to please him and I want to make my mom happy and I want to make her, you know, um, excited and proud of me. But it can no longer be my North Star. So, I come from a family, basically, where in the past, we just would take all of our feelings and brush them under the rug, right? If we disagreed, there were no arguments or loud shouting. It was just like quiet disappointment, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, and at some point, I realized that wasn't serving me anymore. And so I started to say aloud to them the things that bothered me. And so I usually try in the beginning to say, if, if say, my father was to say something like that to me, which they have in their own way, I, I probably would have said something like, when you say something like that, this is how it makes me feel. You don't love me. You don't accept me. And 
you think that uh, I'm not a success because I haven't done this last thing for you. At which point my parents at varying points have said, dear Lord, one, I said none of that. You made all of that up in your head. Mm -hmm. And two, that's not how I feel at all. I just want the full human experience for you. I want you to feel what it felt like to have this baby. At, where, at that point, I might say back to them, I want you to feel like what it feels like to be on this TV set and to be having these deep conversations and to be feeling like I am sharing my vision with the world of humans who can go out and create more humans in a way that me birthing one out of my vagina uh, doesn't feel the same to me. Mm -hmm. And so I wish you could feel that. I wish you could feel this passion and love that I have for it. But I also wish every happiness for you. And like to almost have that conversation. Now, I've done that. Sometimes it works. And sometimes they're like, you'll never understand unless you have kids, <laughs> you know? And then at that point, you just go, uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, not and smile and, and yeah, do, it, do anyway. it anyway. Yeah, exactly. Oh my God, it's so funny. I, I said that recently to my dad as well. I was like, I just want you to be proud of me. And he was like, oh my God, of course I'm proud of you. And I was like, I just need to hear the words. Like, And I think that that do does come though with building your confidence because if there are moments, you can't predict how someone else is going to respond. And so being able to be okay with yourself yeah. and building your own validation, making sure that you're strong in your mind and how you think and your convictions. Yeah. And I think where I, even when I had to speak out loud that I didn't want children, I was so fearful. And the reason was I was worried about the backlash. And then I started to process, but why are you worried about the backlash, Lisa? And it was because I wasn't comfortable in that decision in the first place. And I just had to get comfortable enough that now if anyone says it to me, it doesn't bother me because I'm so confident in my decision. I don't have um, any angst about it. And yeah. I think that if you do, you just try to convince the other person so they can be on your side. So now you can feel comfortable with the decision you've made. A hundred percent. You know, there's some funny thing about us humans where we, we try to not say the quiet thing out loud and mm -hmm. we do it frequently. And what I found as I've gotten older is because that's such the norm that when you do say the quiet thing out loud, it erases. It's kind of like in the movies when you see the monsters and then they turn on the lights and they evaporate. And so I've tried to have a practice lately of quiet out loud, which is, you know, when somebody says something that I take a certain way, as opposed to just having it sit inside and sort of sit at that seat of resentment, I might say back to them, huh. When you said that, this came up for me. Am I off base on that and allowing them almost the chance to come back? And this sort of happened because I had a deal go bad the other, like a month or two ago with a, with a person we were really close with. Like I am talking super good friends with that ended up stealing from us. Oh God. And uh, myriad of reasons. And, and I remember there was a moment where he was pitching that we invest in this company and do this deal. And he became really close with my husband. And I had one of those gut moments where I was like, ooh, something right there that that guy said made me not trust him. And I talked to my husband around it. And my husband was like, well, do you think you're kind of being hard on him for this? And I was like, oh, okay, probably be hard on him. And then afterwards I was like, I knew it. I knew that moment and I heard it. And so after that, uh, we had another si similar situation come up and I almost overreacted. You know how sometimes instead yeah, of stare yeah, step, yeah. we're like, I was quiet last time, so I'm gonna yell at you this time. Mm -hmm. And so the, the second time when this came up, somebody brought up a deal that they wanted to do with a friend and I just was like, no, I feel I feel things here and no, <laughs> you know? And then, and then I had to like reel it back and sort of figure out why I was so intense. But learning to say the quiet thing out loud, it's amazing. I've never once regretted saying the quiet thing out loud and I regret every time I don't. Ah. Oh. And so maybe try that on for size and see if it works, anybody listening. That's so powerful. Um, I didn't hear the end of these stories, but I had two stories where yeah. you were seriously disrespected. And I was like, how did you handle them? Oh, yeah. Were you silent? And now in hindsight, what would you do? So I heard yeah. that you said that um, somebody, a manager came up to you and patted you on the head Steve. and called you like a good girl. <laughs> yeah, that was a real story. Um, yeah, his name was Steve. Shout out if he's out there. But, you know, to be fair to that guy, which goes back to why I do wish them well. Like I actually wish that guy well. I found out later he had a tragedy that happened to his family when he was young, the kind of which I can't even imagine. And 
So I had so much resentment and hatred for this motion from this guy, which at a base level, like, what is this? It's a hand movement on top of a head. Was it a strike? Did it hurt? Absolutely not. It was an ego blow because I societally said that it could be. And yet he had gone through such trauma before that in the grand scheme of it, not that big of a deal. And so um, the thing that happened was I was quite high at a, at a finance company. And he basically walked up with me with a group of our other partners and managing directors at the firm. And before I was going to go on stage, so at a moment where I'm priming, right, you're getting ready to go out and be this other version of you, he sort of takes me down a notch and sort of pats me on the head and said, like, be a good little girl, you're up next or something like that. And I remember being so shocked that I was the opposite of what I wanted to be. Like, I want to be the Ari from Entourage, like mm. the smart little comments back. And I'm really not very good at that. And uh, so I, I said nothing. I just sat there quietly. And then I, you know, went up later. Um, so that was one of those moments that I was quiet. But in that moment, actually, the difference there, I think, is what would it have served me to clap back at him? I think it would have helped my confidence, perhaps. But in moments like that, it's more like, huh, Steve, that that didn't make me feel that comfortable. Or did you mean to do that? Because that didn't feel that great. And doing what you said, which is not shaming him. Like in today's society, I think there's a lot of like, how dare you, you know, do X, Y, and Z. I wouldn't go that far. I'd just go, oh, I didn't really like that. I don't like when people touch my head. Do you mind not doing that again? It made me feel uncomfortable. Um, and kind of brushing it off. And instead sticking with the moments where you're like, oh, no, this could be a decision that would have a serious outcome, like investing with somebody, becoming a partner with somebody, marrying with somebody, and being able to diff tell the difference between the moments that are ego-driven and the moments that can change the trajectory of your life. Yeah, because I, I, then I heard you say that you've had like, oh, if I could count the amount of times that in the corporate world someone grabbed my ass. Yeah, does that uh, ever happen to you? And well, you ran the businesses. So I, it was a, yeah, it was very yeah. different. But to be honest, I've had I've been patted on the head. So I'm five foot one. Oh, you've been. Oh, and I've been patted by women, by one particular woman. Wait, what? Really? Yeah, and I have it. And she, the first time I was like, oh, that's cute. She's like, oh, little Lisa, oh. and I was like, oh, that's, that's cute, fine. I've been called little Lisa a lot. Um, and then she kept doing it. Oof. And I was like, oh, this is an ego thing. Um, now, back then, I didn't necessarily have the confidence to speak up. And now, to your point, I would address it because it becomes, it isn't just an ego thing for me because it's not like, oh, you're trying to belittle me. It's kind of like you're trying to do this for your own ego yeah. to make yourself bigger. Yeah. And I'm so strong on boundaries now and being treated in a way that I think is very respectful, I would definitely point it out and I wouldn't be cruel. I wouldn't like scream or yell. That would be yeah. my, like back then, I think like that would have internally to my, to your point about, you know, like you, you have that thing inside and you're just like quiet in yeah. it. I beat myself up that I didn't say anything. And so now I think I would say something, but I would say something in a very direct way, in a very strong way and let someone this, you know, this doesn't fly, but not in a way that made them feel shameful, but in a way that let them know, hey, you can never do this to me again. And even in those moments where it's like, now I just have trained myself, right? It's like going into the gym. I think when someone's trying to get fit, that first step of walking into the gym can be so damn paralyzing. Mm -hmm. You never go to the gym, mm -hmm. but once you go, for the first time, then you go again. Oh, it's easy. Like here's a parking spot, and here's how you, know, you figure out the machine. And so the the practice of doing things that scare you, I think, then train you to get better, so that when those moments come, you feel like you have the confidence. And um, I've really heard you talk about your fears and how you've trained your fears, which I love. Um, but tell me, tell me about the fear that you were afraid of heights. Oh yeah. And you, uh, what was it that you were trying to climb? M Mount Baker. Yeah. So, yeah, if you don't mind sharing that story, because I actually, there's so much power in conquering your fear or not conquering your fear. Yeah. So um, I think heights is one of the top five fears that humans have. And I'm one of those. I don't like heights whatsoever. And um, speaking of poorly setting boundaries, I said yes to a trip to technical climb mountain called Mount Baker. And I actually just didn't think very much. You're roped up to a team of other people with ice axes and crampons, so the, the steel clips on the bottom of your feet, and a helmet, and um, special boots, and um, you're falling in crevasses on you know this this mountain. It's a whiteout. You can't see anything happening. Um, it was everything that I wish 
it was not. Uh, it was awful. And I also don't like the cold. So it's freezing cold and we're climbing on like the, the peaks of these volcanoes and off of this um, hillside. And I'm pretty categorically miserable. And, uh, and what was interesting for me in that climb is I did it, I think, because I was like, I, Cody Sanchez, am a type of human that conquers fears. And so watch me. I shall climb this mountain and it'll be great. And I probably am tougher than all these other bitches, you know? And they were like girlfriends of mine. But I'm like, stay, so I'm way tougher than you. And, uh, and then as we're climbing, I'm like, oh my God. You know, I'm one in my head. I'm like, I kind of miss this other stuff that I was wanting to do at home at the moment. I had really hard stuff I was working on in my business, which was like the hard that I wanted to do. And now I'm like fake manufacturing difficulty climbing this mountain. So I was kind of getting pissed about it, but I was like, all right, I'll just finish it. And it's four days. How bad could this be? And we get all the way up to, um, the right before you summit Mount Baker. So it's like on the second or third day of the hike. And, um, we're past base camp. We're almost to the summit and it's a whiteout. You can't see anything. And, um, Climbing, technical climbing mountains is also a real joy because you have to carry, uh, you know, anything that comes out of your body uh, oh. the entire time on you in little bags too. So if you have to go to the restroom one or two while you're roped up to your friends, you have to go stop, everybody please turn around and you're doing, you're roped up to people Whoa. with a bag. I mean, it's miserable. <laughs> and so anyway, um, I'm at the very top. We're paused before we're gonna go summit the ice wall. At which point the ice wall is you have to step sideways uh, up the ice wall, which is however many hundreds of feet with your ice axes and don't fall because you fall. You're going to hang on the rope. You could pull everybody else down. Um, and I was starting to feel a little off and I, like my stomach was hurting and I was stressed that I was going to have to poop on a rope with a bunch of women like that didn't sound great. And um, and at some point I just looked around. And I was like, why? Wait, what am I doing? Why am I trying to get to the summit? I never wanted to be a mountaineer. This isn't on my bucket list. I feel perfectly comfortable with myself. And so I just looked around and I was like, I looked to one of the guides and I was, I was like, would it mess us up if I wanted to go down back to base camp on the second level? Uh, or could a guide take me? And they're like, oh no, it wouldn't mess it. So I was like, everybody else could keep going. And they're like, yeah, totally. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go down. And all the other women were like, oh, how, what do you mean? Like, are you okay? Can we help you do this? Let me, I think somebody handed me a fucking quest bar actually. <laughs> up there. I, sh I should ask Stephanie. That's I think they did. They're like, are you hungry? Do you need more fuel? I was like, no. I was like, actually, I'm really good in this decision. I'm going to go down. And, um, Anyway, so I start going with the guide. We, we, we sprinted down that mountain. I mean, I don't think I've ever moved so fast. We get down to base camp. I lay down. I'm like, oh, I'm going to sleep. Everything hurts by this point. Your feet are bleeding all over the place. Everything's all ripped up. I'm laying in my tent and I close my eyes. And all of a sudden, it's like I had taken three uh, pills of LSD or something. I am tripping balls, at which point I realize I have severe altitude sickness. <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't summit because who knows what would have happened at the top. And at that point, I thought, you know, you get to choose your hard and life will give you hard no matter what. I truly believe that. We are here to struggle and to realize that we are capable. And once you realize that, you don't have to manufacture hard that is not meant for you. And I do think in this day and age, there's a lot of us who say, but I should be an entrepreneur because it's the hard thing to do, but I should have a child because it's the human experience. And it's like, you get to choose your hard and nobody else does. And I felt more freedom from not accomplishing that thing that I did not actually want than many accomplishments that I've actually had, which was hard for me because I'm not sure I've ever set out on a goal like that and not accomplished the thing. And yet I was happier than ever. So that was Mount, Mount Baker. It's Don't do such, it. It's such a powerful story though, because to your point and just digging into your story, dude, the stuff that you've accomplished is just insane, like Thanks. insane. And so to think about that and to think about being that person that like has a very strong mind goes and does this thing. And then I don't want to say give up, but like you do kind of turn around. Oh and so then to hear that you now are just like the, the lesson that you've learned is like, no, I'm very proud of myself. And that the fact that you learned that lesson of like, don't just do hardship because it's hard. Choose the stuff that actually uh, 
resonates with the person that you want to be, with the goals that you have and not other people. Because you even said at the beginning, it's like, I don't even know why I was climbing this bloody mountain in the first place. But you just get in that perpetual motion of people telling you that you should. Then it's the challenge that you're like, oh, well, I can't say no. And where does that lead? End up le leading a life that you don't actually love. It's so true. I mean, who... Who celebrates the things that you let go of and the things that you failed at? Very few people. Actually, Astro Teller, he was the head of Google X. Um, so that was Google's incubation lab, right? So they, they have all these wild ideas. And one thing that's cool about Astro is outside of his office on the wall, he has a resume and it's his failure resume. It's all the things that he has failed and done wrong. And so we actually copied that from him and one of my other friends, Alex, and inside of my office and now the office that we just bought um, is sort of a board. And on the board are all of the bad investments we've made are all of the things people have said about us that were that were bad and stuck, not all the ones on the internet because there's too many, <laughs> but like, you know, all of those things that you almost want to keep inside uh, and instead mm. I display them. And the reason why is because there are little badges of, of honor in some way. Like this difficulty happened, we overcame them. And I never want to forget those. I want to continue to take inventory of them because what happens is when you put your failures up to the light, they're much harder to forget. They're right there. Right. And so it's been a helpful exercise for us. So how did then in those moments, because I, I hear the freaking power go, I hear it, but also is it because you're okay with the failures? Because I can also imagine that yeah. if you've got them there in the light with the lights, like it's like a blasting siren every time you walk into your own back that you're a failure. Yeah. So how do you make sure that you use that as motivation and not something that actually brings you down? I think you have to allow yourself a, a period of um, grief. Mm -hmm. Like, allow yourself that period when someone passes and you're sad, when a failure happens and it's too fresh. Maybe it doesn't go on the wall yet. Mm -hmm. Give yourself that. But at some point in time, as long as you are still breathing, you will overcome it. And at one point in your life, whatever point that will be, you will look back and think, oh, that's not so big anymore. And at that point, you put it on the wall. And so you don't have to do it that same day if that doesn't motivate you. If it motivates you after you've already overcome it, just don't forget it. Put it somewhere quiet. Put it in a notebook that you don't have to look at. Because I think one day being able to look back at all the moments that you almost broke and realize that you didn't is an incredible stack of evidence of what you can overcome in the future. You know, a lot of people say that you should... You should stack up all of the accomplishments that you've had in your life and you can look back on those and feel inspired by them on a go forward basis. I actually like to do the opposite. I want to stack up all the difficulties I've had, all the failures, all the moments that I was almost broken because you don't, you don't get scared or challenged by the accomplishments that come, you know, when, when a new accomplishment, when, when Lisa gets her most viral video or when, you know, you hit a new revenue goal, you're not like, oh, this is hard. You're like, that's great. And maybe you celebrate a little bit and then on to the next one. But when you get sued for the first time or when somebody steals from you or when your heart gets broken, you need a moment of inspiration in that. And one of the best moments of inspiration, I think, is to go back and look at the last time your heart was broken and realizing, oh God, I forgot about Sean entirely. I felt the same way though. Okay, maybe one day I'll feel like that about Brad. Mm -hmm. And failure, I love Brad. <laughs> um, and failure also, when you talk about it, I don't know if you've noticed, people resonate more with you because you're talking about your failures. That's true. They don't think of you, put you on this pedestal. And that was the one thing, like I never want anyone to put me on a pedestal because I have failed so many times. And I think that there's so many lessons to your point in the failures. I definitely, um, now I think I've gotten better, but like before, like seeing my failures in broad daylight was just too painful for me, especially the ones that really not only almost broke me, but ones that actually broke me. But I got back up. Yeah. And so those I think are very hard to see. But I heard this study where this guy like hired these um, two actors and they're selling like blenders. And so they go to the mall, you know how like back, I haven't been to a mall in ages, but you know, back in the day where they would like do these demonstrations to sell yeah. like the blender. And so he hired these two actors and one of the actresses does, um, puts in like the food and like the protein powder and does everything amazing. And she looks perfect and she like blends it and then gives it out to the thing. 
Then they have another actress that comes in and she puts in like a bunch of ingredients and she forgets to put the lid on and she's a bit of a mess and she forgets, she presses it on and it splashes everywhere. Who do you think sold more blenders? The second one? The second one. Wow. Because she was more relatable because everybody else was like, oh my gosh, she's just like me. Yeah. And so like really going to, if you can understand that that was just a study done, I remind myself of that study now every time that I fail because I'm like, oh, this is an inspiration. Like even if it's not an inspiration for the other people, it can be an inspiration for myself because I can look at it and go, oh, there's joy to be found in the mess up. There's joy and lessons to be found in the mess up. So true. It's kind of like we talk about something called the Taylor Swift effect, which is I became fascinated by how people love this woman mm -hmm. and just the raving fans she has. And so I, I started thinking why. Actually, I was talking with one of our friends, Vanessa, about it. I'm like, why is it about Taylor Swift? I like her, but I don't like, what is it exactly? And what we realized is, is that she turns her pain into her product every time. Mm -hmm. Breakup, product, breakup, product. You know, difficult thing that happened with uh, the guy that we were talking about, the agent. Um, then she releases like all new albums that are just the Taylor Swift thing. And so I think the Taylor Swift effect is basically, how can you be so real and raw that every time somebody is going through their most vulnerable moment in time, they will think of your product, your song, your words. So their heartbreak and the thing that helps them get through it are the words from a Taylor Swift song. When their friend is, um, you know, when their friend lies, cheats and steals from them, they hear bad blood. Like, and that trigger point is the moment at which, if you think about it historically, that's what, that's what cults did, right? They basically would find people at those trigger point moments and they would imbue them at that moment with their gospel, whatever it was. And she's doing that in a positive manner. And so I think her, turning her pain into her product and then finding her trigger moments in her fans or clients and inserting her product into that moment meant that every time we are in our feels more than anything else, her product's going to come in front of us. And I don't know if she did that thoughtfully, but if I'm to break it down, that's the way I see it. And I think it's fascinating. It's such a business mind as yeah. well. It's like, why does this work? How does it work? Yeah. Um, I do think that that's powerful. I'm not really, I don't really listen to many Taylor Swift songs, but, um, it can also be, depending on who you listen to, a detriment because um, have you heard now about like the depression porn, like content, where basically like there's content out there that's all about like real sad stuff and people watch it. And if you're feeling depressed, you go to that because it makes you feel better because there's other people out there like you. Oh, the problem is I think it keeps you stuck. Yeah. It's like when I'm down and sad, to your point that you mentioned earlier, like give yourself time to cry, yeah. but then you better freaking be putting on some like Beyonce, some, you know, Destiny's Child Survivor. That's like one of my best songs. I just yeah. put it on and it gets me amped because I know I can't stay there. Yeah. And so what do you turn to in those moments where you're to your knees? Are you turning to something that's going to keep you there? Or are you turning to something that can be empowering to then pull you back up? I, when I'm down, I move. I think your physical state is very much tied to your mental state. And moving my body feels easier than changing my mindset often. Mm. Sometimes mm. it's just hard to get out of your brain and stop feeling sad or stop feeling upset. And so perhaps you're actually doing the same thing. With the song, what do you do? You don't stand here and listen to like uh, to a Beyonce song like this, right? Like <laughs> you're you're moving around. Mm. And so your physical state ends up changing your your mental state. And and so um I think there's sort of like I was thinking about this the other day, actually, when I was thinking about this conversation, I'm like, what are like the four levels to change? And I think, you know, the first level of change is, you know, you change your context. So if I was feeling sad, like when I got a divorce, I moved, left the house, left the city. So I think you change your location. Then I think you move your body. Then I think, uh, the, then you, then I think you fill your, your brain with some different you know, information, maybe it is the, the songs, dancing. And then I think you try to evacuate those thoughts out of your head. And so, you know, it's change your context, then it's move your body, then it's change what you fill yourself up with. And then finally, you can get rid of those things inside you that you don't want to keep any longer. But for me, I could never just jump to the end. Mm -hmm. I had to start with the things that I could control. Like, you know, right now, if I'm like, Lisa, Give me five push-ups. You can do five push-ups even if you're crying. If I'm like, Lisa, be happy. You're like, yeah, motherfucker, I know. 
I know. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Hard to do. Hmm. And so, but it's also hard to be really upset if you're jumping up and down, doing jumping jacks, doing push-ups, you know, lifting weights and listening to a great song. Yeah. God, I love that. And as you were saying about moving as well, like even changing cities, um, it reminded me of that study that you've spoken about, about in business when you're around, if you're an A player and you're around B players. So actually explain that study because I really do think it links to the people around you can either keep you stuck, but changing your environment and your friends or people that you're around can absolutely help you change your state of mind? To me, it is scientifically proven that the people around you influence who you are in ways that you don't even want to begin to understand. Because if you are in a group right now of people who do not have the desired life that you want, you are looking at your future. And the study, this one in particular, showed that it was through a series of multiple companies, hundreds if not thousands of people, and what they found is that if you seat a, uh, a top performer around colleagues that are normal performers, it'll increase those normal performers' performance by about 15%. And if you seat a poor performer around your normal colleagues, it will decrease their performance by 30%. So if you make $100,000 a year, I think about it like, well, if you sit next to a top performer, you might be able to make 115, not because you're better, not because you're smarter, not because you're different, but because you're inspired by the energy that's contagious. If you sit next to a poor performer, that $100,000 could very quickly become $70,000 because you are sitting next to somebody that is in an energy drain that is non-motivational and that is bringing your performance down. So one, how can you be the type of human that's the former? and not the latter. And two, how can you lovingly wish them well, but not surround yourself with people that are poor performers? Because even if we don't want to believe it, we have all felt it. You get done with a conversation of people gossiping. Do you ever feel better? No. You get done with a conversation like this, being around people, you're like, oh, that's such a good idea. Oh, I want to write that down. You listen to an incredible podcast because maybe you don't even have friends that are inspirational you have that same energy feeling. You get done watching a trashy Real Housewives of whatever show, how do you feel? Depressed. And so really being thoughtful on, you don't have to be better all the time. Maybe just input a few better things into your life and watch how much easier that little breath of willpower begins to build. Mm, I love that so much. So how do you start to take inventory about the people that are around you? I'm very conscious now about how I feel with people. My therapist actually uh, has a beautiful thing. Um, she basically tells us to take our body temperature. And so um, when, you know, I'm a fiery Latina, my husband's former military guy, we can clash, right? And, uh, and so when we were fighting, we tend to be pretty technical. So we would focus on very specific things like, you know, but you dad did this and you did this. And so we were kind of negotiating reality. And instead, she started stopping us and saying, okay, uh, I want you to sit right now. You're a little elevated. What do you feel in your body? And I'd be like, pissed off. She's like, not a feeling. <laughs> like, <laughs> she's like, that's an emotion. What do you feel in your body? And I'd be like, I'm a little hot. Okay. My, my chest is a little tight. Okay. Um, you know, I clench my hands sometimes. If I start feeling uncomfortable, I move around a lot. Um, you know, I might like start looking other places, right? And she's like, I want you to note all of those things because you have all of these little red flags that go up in your body every time you start feeling something. And usually we ignore them. We just don't pay attention to them. We block them out. She's like, what if you start realizing what your body's already telling you? And I was like, it's fascinating because now I can tell when I look at Chris, my husband, I can tell when he's starting to get slightly elevated. He'll like, start to do this to his ear, right? You can tell the triggers on other people, but do you know them in yourself? Mm -hmm. So now, when you are in a conversation next with people, start to see how you feel afterwards. Start to see how you feel during. Oh, they're talking about this? Oh, I kind of got that tingle right there. I'm a little tight. And that will usually tell you, are you around people where your dream outcome is their everyday reality? Or are you around people where their everyday reality is your nightmare? And I really start to question that continuously. And then the last thing I'll say on it is like, I don't believe that we should just throw people by the sides and not help them. That's why you and I both have a platform where we talk about this publicly. But I'm not good enough to be one-on-one -on -one with people that bring me down. I'm not a Buddhist monk. I can't do it. And so I know that. And I do one-to-many instead of one-on-one. -on -one.
So if there are people that need help emotionally or, you know, spiritually or physically or whatever, they can listen to all of my content that I put out there, but I won't one-on-one engage with people that are going to pull me down because I'm not strong enough to do that. Mm -hmm. And so giving yourself some grace and knowing that that's okay, I think is really important. You can still help people, but you do not have to meet them at their level. How do you then start to meet the people that are at your level? Oh yeah, it's a good, I think you want to do, you know, if you want to be a, if you want to be a cool person, do cool shit. And I think that's the easiest thing. Like people who are cool want to be around other people who are cool. And what do I mean by that? I don't mean like actually, you know, cool like we were in high school. I mean, curious, building something, experimenting, trying something, asking a lot of questions, um, trying to make their mark on the world. I think the best way to be around really inspiring people is to try to do something inspiring yourself. And you'll be so surprised what happens when you start doing that. I mean, think about you and I were both talking about it. When we were first trying stuff on the internet, we didn't look cool, you know? Like we were a cringe city, right? (laughs) And now maybe people think it's cool, but only do we get to meet people like each other because we tried to do this inspiring thing, you know? verdicts out to see if we we achieved it. But um, that is the secret is like, I don't believe in networking at all. I believe you do really interesting things to you and you try to build and make your mark on the world and you will just find other builders. You will not be able to stop them from being attracted to you. I love that. Yeah. When people say to me, you know, how do you find somebody or like even in a relationship, I'm like, yeah. well, where's the person that you would you would want to be with? or who you want to be with, where would they go? And so like, if they have a growth mindset, because I think that that's really the key to any relationship. It's not even communication. You need the growth mindset to then be open to having the communication discussion. Um, And so where do people with growth mindset go? Go there, right? Like go onto websites, go onto these different, and I know it's not easy, but that's what I would start with. and then the one thing I wanted to ask you, dude, you're so freaking fire. Like, I love your person, like your person. This is actually the first time we've met in person, but you're so freaking badass. And what I want to know is, do you have a negative voice in your head that's telling you you're no good? Have you ever made plans with your homies and you're really excited about it? But when you're there, a wave of fatigue washes over you and you're just freaking shattered. Guys, I've been there too fake and a smile when actually I'm feeling totally drained. Unexplained fatigue and constant exhaustion, guys, are not normal. But the great news is you don't have to just accept these symptoms anymore. You can take control of your microbiome and health with our sponsor, Viome. Viome's at-home full-body intelligence test gives you 50 comprehensive scores and recommendations to improve your unique microbiome. Simply collect your sample, send them back to Viome, and let the scientists do the rest. In just two to three weeks, you get your scientifically backed personalized nutrition recommendations in the Viome app. And as a special offer to my viewers, you guys, Viome is offering $110 off your test. Go to tryviome.com slash W-O-I and use coupon code W-O-I. Click the link in my descriptions or scan the QR code on the screen right here. Homie, take back control of your health and show up with the freaking badass energy that you deserve every single day. Just one? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, um, for sure. You know, there's there's like a little army back there of, of little Cody's or whatever it is inside there that's saying like, you can't, how did that sound? Oh, you know, perfect example. After I get on, done on a podcast like this, I'll typically listen to it and I'll go, Oof. I say the word actually a lot. Or I'll go, ah, oh, can you believe how many times I said this instead of this? So there's always like a little critic. And I think the only way that I have moved forward with that is to see them as a small little guide. They're like my little bumper rails. Mm. And usually the things that they have to say have some bearing in truth. You know, it's like, oh yeah, you could pay a little bit more attention to that. That's fine. Or, um, mm, did you fib about that? Like, you know, do are you sure that like you're, that's what you want to do? You know, th- I think the little voices inside of us are by and large kind of trying to help. And they just, they're scared for us. You know, they, they don't want us to fail. You know, they also are sometimes a byproduct of the other people we've let into our lives. And so um, there's somebody famous who used to have this um, thing she talked about called the table. And now I can't remember who it is. 
Anyway, so she basically said, imagine like every time you have one of those little negative voices in your mind, imagine a conference room table. And the, usually there's like different voices saying different things to me. So let's say I'm coming on Lisa's podcast and I'm nervous about it. There's like the one that's like, oh, um, what if you mess up? Okay, that's you. I see you right there. You're sitting there. Then this this person like, are you sure that you have enough to communicate? You know, what if your alarm doesn't go off? Uh, you know, you're going to be late. Like all the little things. And you, I see them like as little humans around mm -hmm. a table. And basically what she says then is you go to each one of them and you just repeat back, you know, you're scared that the alarm isn't going to go off. Why don't we set it for this morning? Let's double check it. Would that be okay? Okay, that feels okay. You think that you don't have enough to share. Do you want to maybe put together a few thoughts somewhere? And maybe if we do that, then you'll feel more comfortable. Okay, would that be enough? Yeah. And I like negotiate with them mm -hmm. around the table until finally by the end, I can go to sleep at night. And so the conference table helps me when those little things, when the little gremlins are at play. I love the conference table and Angie. I always thought of it as like, oh, I call it like she used to be the bitch in my head. And now she's like my BFF. Because to your point, yeah. she's just got my back. Yeah. She's just trying to warn me of all the things um, that I may worry about. Um, and But that critic can really paralyze people. And once I started to realize the critic was actually my coach, it like changed everything for me. Um, but I think people think that just because you show up confident and like a freaking badass, and especially because you're very successful, people are like, oh, she must think that she's got it all. But... You can do that when you can manage and control the voice in your head. But when the voice in your head is actually leading you yeah. versus what you actually want to do, it can become crippling. It's true. What 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 made you flip on that? I just I'm so goal oriented. And so to your point of like, okay, what am I about to do? Why am I doing it? So my husband, um, I got invited to go public speak a lot. And I just kept saying, no, I was like, why would I do that? Like, that seems so petrifying. That doesn't make any sense. And my husband called me on it. He's like, babe, you said that your mission is to help people. And I was like, it is. And he's like, but then why don't you get on stage? Because you've just been invited to be able to help thousands and thousands of people. I was like, God damn you, Billy. You know, and just like, I was like, okay, he's got to, he's right. But I'm too scared. And I was like, the, the voice in the head is saying, Lisa, you're going to mess up. And so I was like, okay, what is she, how do I get rid of this voice so that she doesn't stop me anymore? She's saying mess up. Okay, what if I actually mess up? I need mm -hmm. a game plan. I need a game plan for if I mess up. And so then I realized, oh, she's trying to help me so that if I messed up, I don't freeze on stage. That would really knock my confidence. But I wanted to show up. So being able to come up with a plan of what I was going to do. And I realized it was like, you know, parents with kids. So it's like the kids look at the parents and be like, should I cry? And when the parents like, oh, ha, 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 you're so silly, the kid made just laugh. So I was like, oh, that's going to be your plan, Lisa. When you go on stage, just laugh. And so I ended up doing, um, I had steps to make sure that I would do a, um, a talk on stage. And the step one was just say yes. If the thing that you're fearful of, just say the next person that offers me this, I'm just going to say yes, like make a promise to yourself. That was one step. Then it was sadly, the first thing I said yes to was a TEDx talk. <laughs> That's amazing. That was like my first spe my first first speaking gig ever. So I go on stage and within the first two minutes, I end up like um, totally messing up. And I said that my my father gave birth to my grandmother. And I was like, oh shit. And I was like, well, that would be weird. And everyone just started laughing. And I started laughing and then I moved on. But that taught me a very hard lesson and a beautiful lesson that the voice in my head is not bad. The voice in my head isn't trying to hold me back. The voice in my head is just trying to help me learn that if I mess up or if I do this thing, what are the things that I'm not consciously aware of? Instead of saying, hey, you need a plan B. It's not saying that it's like, hey, you're going to fuck up. But what is actually trying to teach me? So That's so good. Yeah, I think, I think also, um, like kind of like you said, I like the becoming friends with it. Mm. I like that idea of, you know, can you actually become friends with your critic? Can you shake hands? Can you walk alongside them? Can you see them as your older version of you, the younger version of you? I think it's really powerful. My grandmother always used to say to me, you know, you take a picture and you don't like the picture of you. You're like, oh, God, I look fat there. Mm -hmm. I look bad there. I look whatever. And my grandmother, in one instance where I was doing that, looked at me and she was 89 and she said, honey, when you're 89 and you look back on all these you're going to think you're hot in everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and so sometimes I sort of channel her and I think of like my 89 year old Cody looking back and thinking, gosh, you know, that was pretty incredible. Or looking back and saying, man, what do you do when you're old? 
when you're old, you sit around kind of in your rocking chair, right? You have your coffee or your tea and you share stories. You're not climbing mountains anymore. You're probably not giving speeches on stage. So what do you need to have when you're 89? You need to have some fucking good stories. And so maybe the one where you talk about your dad giving birth to your grandfather, uh, maybe that's a story that you get to keep. And so we want to just accumulate a bunch of those in our lives. Yeah, I love that. But I'm going to challenge you. I absolutely am going to be giving speeches in my 90s. I I can't believe just, that, actually. I just met a woman. I interviewed her for my show. She was 102. And she just wrote a book on longevity. Wow. She's a doctor. And she's so cognitively there. And she talks about one of the things that keep people alive, the way she's been able to be so cognitively aware and present, even at 102, is your juice. And what she calls your juice is your mission. I love that. And she's like, the second you let go of your mission or the second you stop juicing, she's like, I've seen people die around me. And she's like, you just got to make sure that you've always got the juice. Interesting. I love that. That's like that 97 year old or whatever that hiked Everest. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, I think there is something about, I mean, my grandmother is 95, 96, and uh, she golfed until she was 90. And um, she was widowed for 45 years. Mm -hmm. um, this is so inappropriate, but I feel like this channel can handle it. Uh, I, uh, so we took her to Chicago. This was probably like 10 years ago or 12 years ago. And she told me, you know, she'd been, she'd been widowed for 40 some odd years. And um, so I was like, oh man. And I don't know why, but it just came out of my mouth. I was like, grandma, when's the last time you had sex? And she, and she was like, uh, it's been a while, Cody. And I'm like, like, how long? She's like 20, you know, however many years, decades, right? And I was like, God, do you have a vibrator? <laughs> and she and she looked over at me and she was like, I don't. Should I borrow yours? Because she didn't know what it was or what I was talking about. Incredible. So oh to this day, God. you can just imagine me, my grandmother, my mom, my mom dying <laughs> as my grandmother asked to borrow my vibrator. And sometimes I just think like that is the energy that I want to have. I know. I was going to say like in our, in our 90s, we absolutely should be having our vibrator and uh we'll know what they are yeah though, at least well, <laughs> that's you know? so true yeah that's we'll at least it. have that and we're not having sex for 20 years yeah well speaking of just like being body strong which i like to think of it as you've actually said there's three things that you really believe that we all need so it's a strong mind a strong body and a strong bank account yeah it's sort of the underlying mission of contrarian thinking it's our juice i really believe that first all freedom starts with financial freedom because it's really hard to be able to philosophically explain yourself to fight for the battles that you want to fight if you can't pay your rent or get food to your family. Really hard. So that's why we started talking about money at Contrarian Thinking. It's not really because I care about being rich or making a bunch of rich people richer. It's because I think that if we all sort of have our basic needs met and realize there's abundance out there, we can go pretty far. And, um, and then, you know, I started to realize, man, if you have a bunch of money, but you're sick and you're fat and you're sad in your body, the money doesn't really matter. You need to have a strong mind and a strong body. And I think in this day and age, we really, we should celebrate all different types of bodies, but we should be really thoughtful on making sure we push people to be healthy because we don't do that very well in the US. And then I think finally we can get to our mind. I think our mind is the hardest thing to conquer um, because it's there's so many tentacles to it. You know, I think about it a little bit like, like a hydra. It's got all of these heads that you have to figure out. Money is actually, I think, one of the easier things to break through, but your mind is, is difficult. And so I think um, at Contrarian Thinking, we try to get you to the pinnacle, which is, you know, can you be a self-actualized human who can really think for yourself? Um, and we just, we just launched an Instagram account actually focused on this with the idea that I loved the Stoic movement. Mm -hmm. You know, I think what Ryan Holiday has done is really, really cool. I'm a big fan. Um, and I thought we needed one additional level, which is Stoicism is like whatever happens in life, you know, I will handle with sort of this calm ability to think uh, rationally about it. And I kind of think we need one level on top of that, which is I'm not just going to stand by calmly to all that's around. Not that that's what I'm saying uh, stoicism is, but I'm going to really think critically about the world around me. And I think today we are, there's an assault on our intelligence, on our attention. And so contrarian thinking is this, it's a pushback. I want to get to the greats who questioned all things and stood out from the herd. And I think that's what you guys do here. You're willing to be that devil's advocate you talked about. And I hope that's what we can do. We can start shining a light on humans 
that said things that at the time people thought they shouldn't have. We need more of that in this world. How do you find comfort and security in questioning everything? Because I think that that does start to unravel maybe people's beliefs, right? And so it's like there is that comfort in staying where you are and thinking the way that you think. And so how do you start to question everything and how do you find it empowering? There's a, a gentleman that I follow by the name of uh, Don Dipani, and uh, he's he's a monk. And um, one thing that he says that I really liked is um, he sort of has this reflection of who are you? And so, you know, he asks questions like, Lisa, who are you? Are you your body? And it's like, well, no, because your body changes over the years. So you're not your individual body. Plus, uh, you know, at some point you can tell that there's still a body there, but somebody's died. So, okay, you're not your body. Are you your beliefs? Well, no, because your beliefs change from when you thought you were a dinosaur when you were three to, you know, whatever Lisa thinks now well into her adulthood, right? So you're not your beliefs because your beliefs morph over time. Okay, are you your thoughts? Well, no, because you can hold this critic in your head that you can hear at the same time as your awareness in the front is saying, like, I don't agree with that. So there's two things going on inside your head. So what actually are you? And when I play that game with myself, then I am very easily able to believe to break any belief system because I realize they're not me. I, I'm not, I don't actually believe in people saying, I am an alcoholic, I am an addict, I am a Republican, I am a Democrat, I am X, Y, Z. I don't think humans are one thing. I think we're many things that probably change over time. And so that's why it's okay to question everything because you're not your beliefs. You're that thing inside that has the ability to question. That's it. Like at the base level, that's what I actually believe. We are just the ability to question things. And if that's true, then maybe we have a moral imperative to actually do some questioning. I love that so much. But why do you think then we label ourselves as things? Because it's not even you're labeling other people, you label yourself. Now, look, I want to say to people at home, I am, I've, I don't have, uh, I haven't been addicted to things. So I want to make sure that if anyone at home is recovering, that we're not yeah. triggering anyone. Um, but the, the labeling of things, yeah. why do you think, is there security in being part of a pact? Yeah, I think it's acceptance. And, you know, to your point, I think I really don't believe in shoulds either. Do you. I'll do me. And I really won't listen to you telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. And you probably shouldn't listen to me either. And your best advice is probably just to listen to your own. But um, I think that we all want to be accepted. It comes from, you know, survival and Darwinism mm -hmm. all the way back in the day when you could not exist as a human once you stepped outside of a, a tribe, very difficult to exist. And so, of course, we want to pride ourselves on acceptance because it could be very dangerous to step outside of the herd. If you've ever been to Africa or watched National Geographic, you see what happens. Animals have safety in numbers and humans are really at the base level no different. And so I think that's why we like to label ourselves. But, you know, even my friends that are X or Y or Z, I think when you dig at it, when you poke at it a little bit, they're like, of course, I'm not only that one thing. I just, I have that aspect that is one side of a many sided diamond that I am. And uh, that's at least a belief that I have that I feel serves me. So, mm -hmm. you know, try it on. I love that what serves me, that final part, because I, again, I'm so goal oriented. And then when something happens, does this serve my goal? Does this serve the person I want to be? Yes or no. And if I've identified the person I want to be, and then I ask myself this question and I say, no, this doesn't serve the person I want to be, then it's easier for me to let it go. A hundred percent. Um and, you know, what was I listening to the other day? Something where they, um, they were talking about, you know, when we plant a seed, um, we don't expect a flower to grow immediately. We don't expect a tree to grow except within years. And if, say, we were to plant a fruit tree, you would plant the seed, you would wait days and days, maybe weeks and weeks until something tiny would sprout. And then that tiny thing to sprout, turn it into an actual tree would take years and years. And then for the tree to actually bear fruit would take more years. Mm -hmm. And so we just know that naturally seed to tree takes some time. And yet when we want to hit our goals or when we want to hit our expectation of change, we shame ourselves when we don't pay attention to it daily or weekly or Lord help us years and we don't change. And so I like to go back to the seed often and realize if I want to change this relatively big thing that feels maybe like the size of a tree, it might perhaps take me years. And that is perfectly okay. And it's okay for you too, or for me. So then do you then put in those incremental steps? Because if something takes 10 years, I think that that's where 
a lot of people with them hesitate to make that change, right? Yeah. Even going all the way back to where we even started from. The yeah. idea where when you were younger, you met this guy, you married him, you had a dream, you bought the house, you bought the house, right? Like that took, how long were you actually married for? Like four years, okay. something like that. Yeah. So four years. So that is a time that now you can't get back. And yeah. so now to even think about undoing that time to then leaving, to then possibly starting again and then finding somebody else and then building that house. Now you're thinking, oh my God, that may be another 10, 20 years. Yeah. And so that fear of having to start over or the seed to the tree can be so overwhelming for people. They yeah. just don't change or they don't make that, you know, that pivot. Um, so how do you go from, okay, I want the seed to become the big oak tree. And do you put in then steps along the way to do that? Yeah. Uh, I do two things. I put a date on the calendar and I put money on the table. And so every time I have some big change I want to make, I know what my two motivators are, which is if it's on a calendar, I'll feel like I have to do it at some point. Yeah, did you put your, your divorce on the calendar? I put the divorce on the calendar. It was private, marked private, but uh, it was on my literal work calendar. And uh, I don't know if I did it on that day. I did it before the day, whatever it was. Mm. And, um, and I think if I hadn't done that, I never would have done it. And uh, it's the same now. It probably drives my current husband crazy because I will tell him often, like, if it's not on the calendar, it doesn't happen. Um, and and so I think if you put it on the calendar and you put money on the table, those two things drive me. I come from, you know, an immigrant family. I didn't have a lot of money growing up. And so if I put money into something, I will pay attention to it. It, you know, money to me feels like a trade of my hours for something. And I can't get those hours back. So I pay attention to that. And so, for instance, with the divorce, I paid for my therapist. And I paid for my divorce attorney. And then I put it on the calendar. And those three things meant like, I'm going to move through this in some way, shape, or form. And my out for it was, if I decided that I didn't want to get divorced, then with my divorce attorney, I could just draft up like a better financial understanding because I realized, oh, I don't even know where our money is. I like, I gave all my power up. He knew where all the stuff was. I mean, I think at that point, at some point during the whole process, he cut off my bank accounts and my credit card. So I was like broke, but had money and had like a, you know, seven figure job at the time, but couldn't access any of the cash. And so I was like, oh, okay, worst comes to worst, I'm just gonna use this divorce attorney to draft up some better paperwork for financial understanding. Um, but those two things make a big difference. And so what are your levers? Pick two or three levers that you know motivate Lisa. If it's like, if I tell my mom I'm gonna do something, I know she's gonna nag me nonstop, so I'll probably do it. Or, you know, I tell Tom something, I know Tom's gonna hold me to it, just like your speech, in, speech. so you'll probably only tell Tom if you really wanna get something done, <laughs> no, yeah. right? And so pick those two or three levers because those levers can again be the bullies to your life. Dude, this has been so much freaking fun. Same. I could talk to you forever. Um, where can people find you and all the amazing things you're doing? And your content's freaking fire, by the way. Thank you. Um, Cody Sanchez on all the socials and contrarianthinking.co is our newsletter. Keep watching to learn how to set boundaries and stand up for yourself when someone disrespects you. When you have a long standing relationship with a close friend or obviously even a family member, you have a tolerance for them because unconditional love works that way, right? You, you just, you are willing to take them for who they are. And that means the good and the bad. And, you know, in particular with Flag, who I love dearly and is like family to me, um, there are certain things that I have put up with over the years in terms of his inability to, for example, ask me about myself. Um, much of our relationship was very one-sided, but because I know him so intimately and because he comes from such a good place, these are certain things that I was kind of willing to look over and be like, all right, he's a little selfish. It's, it's very typical flag. And the little nitpicking over the course of the last couple of years of him pretending not to know my daughter's names and walking into my house like it's his own, going into my refrigerator, bossing around my staff, being dismissive of people. I finally hit my breaking point when he very casually called my daughter in jest a fucking see you next Tuesday. And I have a different relationship with that word than, than mm. probably a lot of women. 
the word in and of itself doesn't really bother me. I mean, Brits use it casually. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, so I don't have like that that's like an unforgivable word. My challenge with that word is you don't, you don't speak to a 16-year-old girl that way as an adult. It's just not appropriate. And you don't speak to your friend's kids that way. And you don't speak to me that way. Mm -hmm. So when I lashed out at him, it was a buildup of a variety of different things that have happened to me by virtue of taking it. So like I have to take accountability for letting those little things consistently slide for a period of two years. And while they were building up for me internally, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And I think the audience understood it as, as something that was just unto itself. This was an event that happened between two friends and Tracy, you need to forgive him. And of course I forgave him um, after you know a lot of conversation and a lot of talking, but the truth is there's a lot more to it. And I don't think that any of us get the confidence to confront people that are close to us without having a history of sort of repeating itself where we take a lot of shit. And candidly, the shit had risen to the top and it was flowing over. And that's what made me promptly sort of say enough. And, and it felt, it, it was emotional. It was authentic. I take none of it back. And I think it ultimately changed our relationship for the better. Wow, girl, thank you for breaking that down. And the ownership part is such a powerful part because it's not like you're blaming yourself, but you're taking accountability. Yeah. Um, and I think that that really, t um, A, allows you to recognize where maybe we may be um, accepting bad behavior in other relationships and like calling ourselves on it. Is this okay? Yes or no? Um, and then also in that whole story, I love that you said that you, just, you didn't just like forgive him immediately because he said he was sorry because you've got this history. Um, I believe you actually said to him, sorry only counts when you actually change your behavior. Oh, 100%. And, and like I said, you know, so many times when we have these types of disagreements with someone that's close to us and, and boundaries crossed, more often than not, it's not the first time, right? There are little sort of buildups that lead you to the place where you finally can't take it anymore. And that was my last straw, but it ultimately made me re-examine how I fumbled in the relationship as well. It, he believed that that's just the nature of our friendship, that we poke at each other and we have fun, and we do. But if you don't define limits on what's acceptable and what's not, then yeah, those types of things are gonna happen and eventually someone's gonna cross a line that you might not be able to come back from. So after the event, and after a lot of soul searching and a lot of conversations between him and I, I did forgive him. But it made me, of course, you know, analyze how I allowed it to get to that place and why I accepted sort of mini bad behaviors along the way um, because of his own insecurities or because how I sort of care took him a little bit. And, you know, that's my part in it as well. And those are things that, you know, I have to look at and I have to make sure that if I want to set boundaries with someone, I don't get to set them after I've already screwed up mm -hmm. along the way with like fuzzy lines. And then all of a sudden I decide to draw a line in the sand. And that's my piece of the puzzle that I had to figure out for myself. Oh, dude, that's so powerful. I had a quote once. It was something like um, a fuzzy target is um, impossible to hit. Mm. And I actually like that. It reminded me when you were saying boundaries, it's like if you're not actually clear on your boundaries, how do you expect someone to actually hold to them and actually know what they are if you're fuzzy on them as well? Yeah, I mean, if you don't define them and you're kind of like, you know, I assume you understand, mm -hmm, you shouldn't speak mm -hmm. to me that way. You'd be surprised how many people will run amok. I have teenagers for crying out loud. So like they test boundaries all the time. And so I'm very clear with them on what my line is in the sand, but in adult relationships, in business and in personal relationships, um, more so in personal, I think that we do get a little bit fuzzy because we love the person mm -hmm. and we take the good and the bad, but that doesn't mean we, we can't have a moment where we say, okay, time to reevaluate. Where did I go wrong? How did I fuck up? And what can I do? Because it shouldn't even have gotten to that place where that, that, that becomes a joke. Mm. Calling someone's children or someone's, you know, boyfriend or husband uh, effing see you next Tuesday is not acceptable on any level and it never should be. That's not a joke. That was not produced for television. 
That was 100% <laughs> me at my limit, losing my shit and saying enough is enough. Yeah, and because, in fact, if you don't mind me uh, talking about the boundaries you set for your client if they were disrespectful and how you approach that, because I think that would be a great just ju juxtaposition for us to hear how you just explained your relationship um, with flag and then with I think the the dynamic be, uh, be, we have repeat clients obviously and the more we work with them the more we have a personal relationship with them but typically when I meet a new client I set those boundaries out of the gate here's here's what you can expect from me here are the things that I'm committing to doing for you and with you and here I am available to you at a moment's notice between the hours of 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. Nothing is so urgent in what we do for a living that there needs to be a phone call after 9 p.m. at night. I already am available to my clients much longer than a typical attorney or a doctor would be um, or anybody that is an entrepreneur. Um, and at some point I have to shut it off. So I make that stuff known out of the gate and that those expectations are set. Um, Earlier in my career, I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm available 24 seven. You call me at one o'clock in the morning, I will pick up. Um, I don't do that anymore because I find it doesn't service them and it sur sure as hell doesn't service me. If I don't have time to sort of reset in the evenings, um, then I can't be my best self at 7 a.m. when they actually do need me and when we're in actually during business hours where we can actually get something accomplished other than complain to one another. So I'm very clear with my clients out of the gates about setting parameters on what they can, what their expectations are and what I can deliver. Can I uh, ask you one more thing about that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I guarantee it. They respect you even more because you set those boundaries when you first start. Absolutely. Like, for example, because I am on a TV show, when I go out on a listing appointment from time to time, they know me from the TV show, and they might say, well, we're looking to have you represent us solely. I will, say, I will come to the listing appointment with either my co-listing partner and or my director of operations and say, here's the team for you. I cannot be in 10 places at once. I currently have 15 listings on the market north of $5 million in Los Angeles. So there is going to be times where we need to get a client into your house and I'm going to be booked. And in, if that's the case, these are the people that are going to be there for you during that time. And I set that expectation on the front end so that so they understand it. Question then, do you, so you thank you for sharing that. It's beautiful. And now... Do you set those types of boundaries with your friends and with your partners and? <laughs> I'm much better at setting boundaries professionally than I am personally. I mean, I think we could all agree that that's a little bit more challenging. Our relationships personally have um, so much more important, emotional important to us, um, to our, our us thriving and so, well, I'm willing to sometimes accept a lot less, and that's the journey that I'm on. And, and again, that's why boundaries can be crossed and you can come back from them. But, you know, I'm working on that consistently. I know that's, um, you know, a struggle of mine, um, defining boundaries within my person, what I'm willing to accept from my boyfriend, my ex-husband, um, what my expectations are of my kids. Um, so yeah, I, I, I work on it every day. Dude, so thank you for being so honest because I think, dude, you're such a freaking badass and people are going to be like, oh my God, it's so easy for you. you. You look so confident. You look so straightforward. Like I can say this to anybody. And it's so damn important for people to hear. No, no, no. I work on this every day. No, 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 no. It is easy actually for me in the business now, but it's still difficult in the personal life. And I can only freaking relate, girl. I'm, it's really easy for me to make decisions, to be a boss, to like really lead in business. Mm. The second, second it comes to my personal life, I'm like, what do you want? Oh, I don't know where to eat. I don't know. <laughs> right? Like, and I'm so indecisive. And I'm like, yeah. what the hell? It's so weird how. Our pers uh, maybe our strength or our personalities when it comes to business, we can be very regimented. But once you bring in the heart, I think as women, we just really do care. And so we can't help but have those ever so slightly sometimes blend together. Well, and it's difficult, I think, in, and tell me if you experience this as well. But for me, again, the business piece and being the boss and making decisions comes a little bit easier. I think because of the nature of 
falling on my face so many times to get to where I am today mm -hmm. and now having that success and that confidence that, you know, yeah, I had it when I was born, but I built on that and, and I'm 47 years old. So, you know, when I talk to younger generations about building confidence, I'm like, learn from my mistakes, mm -hmm. right? So being that I am where I am today, there is a part of me that goes from professional to personal and I kind of want to like someone else to be the boss. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of don't want to make as many decisions. And maybe that's a part of me that's just exhausted. And there, you know, a part of innately my personality is maybe I kind of, there's a part of me that wants to take a little, not a back seat, but just rest my weary, <laughs> you know, head for a minute. And, and, you know, I'm a strong personality and I don't typically come with, with or am attracted to someone with a weak personality. So in my personal relationships, that can be difficult because they're like, well, wait a minute. Like, are you the boss? Are you not the boss? Are we equal? Like, what the fuck is going on with you? And I'm like, I just wish that you would take the reins for once and, and, and run the show here. Oh, you dude, know? this is so freaking important because um, I love this. Being freaking strong, independent, knowing what you want, going after your dreams, crushing your goals, and still looking to somebody else like, yeah, I actually want you to lead. To me, it's strength. It yeah. isn't a fucking sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength that you go, I don't need to always lead to feel amazing. I can absolutely feel amazing with having someone else lead. And you know what? Right now, it's actually the decision I think is best for me. That is such a big sign of strength. And I think we need to keep echoing that yeah. because we do think of it as, I think the, the outside world anyway, thinks of it as a sign of weakness. And I think it's trapping us women because we're not able to say, I just want to rest. Like, I am exhausted. I because just want to rest. Be, because we can be looked at, like, you know, someone like your personality or my personality, when we want to take that break, it's like, oh, she's she's a boss and she's so confident, but she's this is a farce. And the reality mm. is it's not. It's, it's, it's understanding and being confident enough to stand on your own two feet and, and make a choice to say... I'm going to I'm going to take a back seat on this one. You run with this. That doesn't mean weakness. It doesn't mean anything, but it can be confusing to the people around us. Because, you know, for example, my boyfriend's expectation is I'm running the show all of the time. As um, in you. Mhm. Mm in but all facets mm -hmm. of my life. So sometimes I'll find that he has a a challenge with like finding a moment where I'm not doing Tracy 10.0. <laughs> you know, and and obviously that's that's a part of who I am organically, authentically, and I get it. Like it's and so when I get frustrated and I'm like, I'm tired, you make a plan for us to go somewhere for the weekend if that's what you want. I don't have time. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I don't know why you're frustrated with me. And the truth is, I'm not frustrated. I just wish you could see <laughs> the layers of of me saying, I'm giving you an opportunity to, to step into this and, and take control of the situation and let me, let me take a rest. And that's very difficult, I think, for the people that love us to understand when's, when's her time? When is she backing out of this equation? And that, I think, is what makes it difficult to be with a woman like myself because you never know when you're supposed to be on or off or go along for the ride or take control of that ride. Yeah. So actually, I wouldn't mind if you wouldn't mind talking about your ex-husband and what um, ended up happening there, because I've heard you say that he was gaslighting you and blaming you that the reason why your marriage was ending was because you were just working too much. Yeah, I want to lead with we've come a long way since mm -hmm. then. And of course, I think the reason I get asked about this a lot is because only very recently have I talked publicly about what happened in my marriage. I spent the better part of five years keeping that very personal and close to the vest because I have children. And the kids now are very aware and very they're astute and they probably knew all along, but it was it was a choice that Jason and I both made to protect them. That said, I came out with it and spoke publicly and now people really do want to know and the truth is he did gaslight me and there was narcissistic behavior on his part be, you know with the gaslighting and and he's done a lot of work on himself since then and i think has made a lot of changes for the better but in those moments 
when you go through something like that and you're in a relationship, whether it's for five years or 15 years like mine, um, there's so much betrayal and there's so much to recover from. And I think in terms of moving forward and making the decision to finally um, file for divorce, again, it was my last straw. It wasn't the mm. first time, you know, again, I talked to you about the fuzzy boundaries um, you know, there are certain things that I accepted over the years because I felt till death do you part, right? Like traditionally, that's how we were raised. When you sign on the dotted line in this contract we call marriage, that's what we're committing to. And I really wholeheartedly believe that until all of a sudden I fucking didn't. And that was after, you know, probably five years of I think both Jason and I being not 100% committed to the marriage and happy mm. did, uh, you know, obviously an affair eventually happen. And that was my final straw of saying, I'm ready to file. And the recovery from that betrayal was very difficult for me. And it took a lot of years and a lot of girlfriends to kind of reset what that looks like. but. The truth is, um, you know, it's about, in my opinion now, I'm redefining how I look at relationships, how I look at marriage, what that means to me, what I'm willing to accept, what I think, what I'm willing to tolerate, what I'm not willing to tolerate, and how do I look at that whole institution? Hmm. And the truth is, I believe still in the institution of marriage, but I think there's different versions of it. I don't think the standard you know, in sickness and in health till death do you part, you know, above everything else is the way to look at marriage. I think it puts women in a situation where, and men in a situation where you're forced to stay in something because you signed up for this tradition that you don't necessarily wanna be in. And I think if we can open up our mindset about how we define marriage and how we look at the relationship, then I think we're gonna be a lot happier in the marriages that we're in mm -hmm. and a lot freer with how we're able to analyze whether or not we wanna stay in them any longer. But, you know, I, I, uh, I do work hard and I expect that that's not going to get in the way and it shouldn't get in the way of having a healthy and happy relationship. And I still firmly believe that, but it's about us redefining how we look at our relationships personally. That's the only way to, I think, have a successful relationship as a woman that is an entrepreneur and in business and is successful at what she does. Why the hell is it? I'm really asking that we accept poor behavior, disrespect, someone pushing you out, like really being mean potentially, and we will keep accepting it. I've heard you even say like, before it really hit the fa shit hit the fan, it was like you were kind of like in no man's land, yeah. where it was like, you're not loving the relationship, but there isn't necessarily a, a defining thing that pushes you to leave. And I, like the amount of people that I've spoken to that are just like, it's the cheating that then made the decision. It was the abuse, like, so even with narcissistic relationships, there are people where it's like, if it's just verbal abuse, sometimes it's like, well, is this enough for me to leave? And it's like, if they hit me, then at least it will be easier for me to say, well, yes, they hit me, so I should leave. And then you'll find an excuse as, you know, that they hit you, but it wasn't really, it was an open hand slap. Like, there's always going to be reasons. I've, I've listened to, I was guilty of it myself for many years. Um, I listen to my friends sort of stay in marriages, you know, for the kids or whatever. Um, you hear it every single day. Us, everybody's sort of pushing the, it down the line. Well, I'm just going to push it 10 yards mm -hmm. down the line, 20 yards down the line. Before you know it, you're like at like, you know, you're in you're at the touchdown on the on their end. Mm -hmm. And you've completely sort of lost the ability to negotiate on your own behalf. I'm like, what? Because you haven't stood up for yourself, mm -hmm. right? But it's, it's, it's defining it differently. You can't sign up for this institution unless you're prepared to follow it to the T. And I don't believe that women today or men today want to follow the old institution anymore. Mm. So why are we not defining that more clearly? Why aren't we having that discussion? 
Why aren't we just, why can't we have an open marriage or an open relationship as long as we define it? And I'm not saying that's for me personally, because it isn't way too jealous of, (laughs) I'm like, you know, I'm like, "Mm." Um, but there's plenty of different ways to have a very successful relationship and or marriage as long as the two people involved can be candid about what their needs are and what their desires are and not attach shame to it Mm -hmm. and and say it from get. And then I think the possibilities are endless, but I still think we're sort of stuck in that old school mentality, which inevitably, by the way, has not served anyone. Uh, More than 50% of of marriages end in divorce. Mm -hmm. So who who is the old institution really serving? Half of the community? You know? Yeah, I've heard you even say like, maybe it should be like a lease. You have to renew it every 10 years. <laughs> I, I was like, oh, you know, I mean, would say that. <laughs> I still believe that. I mean, my friend Sam and, and Natasha and I, you know, talked about that. We were at the uh, my lake house one night and we were we were talking and it was, it was a, my anniversary and I had been through some struggles and I had written a toast to him. And part of that toast was, I'm renewing the lease. <laughs> with an option to back out of that lease, right? And this was our anniversary toast and everybody thought it was hysterical, but there was a lot of truth to it because mm. the reality is this, the tell death do you part piece backs us into a corner where we can't really um, say what we, what we need to say because what we might need to say is that we're not happy and we want out. And that doesn't go along with what we signed up for. Mm -hmm. So it makes us feel like a failure and no one wants to feel that way. Yeah, so true. And I wonder if you don't mind, you just said, oh, I'm I'm way too jealous for that. That surprises me. I like, I'm like, you seem so damn confident. And so jealousy actually maybe helped me think through this. I think of jealousy as being an insecurity. Um, It's not, you know, I think when you, when you've been through what I've been through in terms of going outside of the marriage mm-hmm. and the betrayal that comes along with that and the fact that it wasn't a dialogue that, you know, we had had prior to, you know, executing. <laughs> <laughs> That's very official words. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it left me feeling uncomfortable and um, insecure in my my interpersonal relationships with men. And so, you know, that's something that I I've consistently have to work on that I've carried with me. And I think so many women get this. I don't care if you're 20 or 50, um, you know, at some point you will understand what it means to be betrayed that way. And it affects us on such a deep level because I think that we connect on such a deep level. When we give our hearts to someone women typically, we're all in, Mm -hmm. you know, like once we decide to make that commitment, it's like all barriers are gone. Any wall that we might have is gone. And so when that is shattered, that wall comes immediately back up. And then it's sort of, as an adult, you just begin to chip away. Okay, I got to get back to where I was so that I can be 100% trusting again, because how am I going to give myself to anybody else ever again if I don't feel like I can break down that that wall Mm. and it's a lot of work i think actually as you were talking the thing that probably trips a lot of us up is i want to get back to where i was and the truth is if you've just had a heartbreaking experience you're never going to go back to where you were because you're a different human now you have had your heart broken and so i think it actually could be more powerful to go how do i use this to be better than who i was right right and and it's definitely been something that I don't think I would take back. As I said, had Jason and I not gone through what we went through, I don't think, it, it's just another layer of who I am today that I'm, I'm kind of proud of. It's like a badge of, you know, I went through war and there's some injuries. <laughs> and you, you got know? the to prove it. Yeah. <laughs> But now I feel differently about a lot of things that I couldn't have have felt differently about, like this institution of marriage and relationships, how I look at them now and how I want to be and how I aspire to have more, a deeper connection Mm -hmm. than I had because I went through it. So for me now moving forward, that's all it's about. 
um, I had to have that experience um, for someone like me, I think, to learn from it. Mm, so true. And the experience, um, the experience can be beautiful. But obviously, like you said, very heartbreaking. In making the decision to leave, was um, there any shame around it from other people? None whatsoever. Um, I had a great support system, um, very much so. My family was a great support system. My friends that rallied around me were a great support system. And I would say it took me the better part of five years to fully recover. Um, you know, now, full circle moment, my ex-husband is remarried. I've embraced the woman that he's with, um, who happens to be the woman that he had an affair with. Um, you know, I didn't speak to her or meet her for the first three years of, of their relationship after, you know, we broke up. So I get her. I understand why he chose her. She's quite similar to me in many facets. Um, yes, she's the younger, newer model. However, all the same things and dreams and beliefs and ideas that I had when I was her age, she has. And I think the work that he had to do and the reason they probably connected during our marriage was had everything to do with him not feeling big enough and full enough. So he had to find that 28 year old version of me again to make him feel big enough and important enough because I had grown and I didn't make him feel big enough anymore, you know? And now he, now he gets it. Just have to take a moment, holy smokes. Got so many questions, how? <laughs> and it wasn't about age. Like I've never been like, oh, she's hot or younger. Like it's never about but any how, of that. How, how do you, was that natural? Because here's the thing, though, the truth is a thousand percent, I would go, oh my God, I'm older. Oh my God. I'm like, yeah. I would make it about me. I really would. How did you not make it about you? I think it's freaking beautiful. Uh, I, I mean, I, I won't say in the beginning that I, you know, I, I didn't have moments of that, but I really, the second I understood who she was, I went, oh my God, this has everything to do with him. This, he's meeting me all over again because he required that because he hadn't done the work. He required what I gave him in the beginning of, of our relationship when I was 25 all over again because he lost that pedestal moment of the woman in his life putting him on a consistent pedestal. Now he's had so much growth since then and I think he acknowledges all of that. But what I don't think he still fully acknowledges is how similar her and I actually are. The 28-year-old version of Tracy is very much, um, sim not exactly, but sim very, very much similarities between the two of us in terms of how we adored him and put him on a pedestal. Um, the pedestal just chipped away and chipped away until there was not one left. And that left someone who needed that in order to breathe alone. So it makes sense. Like I get it now. I know why he did what he did. And that makes it a lot easier to forgive him, move on and, and understand. But I also have a, a man in, you know, him in my life that is doing the work to sort of understand that a little bit better. And, it, you know, we chip away at it, but, you know, we're in a really good place. And to me, that feels really good. I sort of feel like we're not a, lot of, not a lot of women that have been through something similar to that can walk away from it and a few years later be having dinner with us as a family with the new wife and myself and the kids and we all know what went down and we've recovered from it and we're stronger because of it. And that's, I think, pretty fucking cool. Dude, it's so fucking cool because you could have postured. Oh yeah, I, and I did. You know, in my own, on my own journey back to like a healthy space around it and figuring out what it was really about and, and doing the work that I've done, yeah. But it took a minute. It didn't happen overnight. Right. But how do you, how do you then greet her? So, the, what, no, like number 762 reasons why I freaking love you is you're such a woman's woman. You're like, I have women's backs. I fucking love that about you, girl. 
So someone who is so supportive of other women, when you see a woman that has an affair with a married man, you don't point the finger at her. You didn't say, oh my God, she's the bitch and you're gonna fucking mess with me and my family. You didn't, at least now. I don't know. I'd love to hear if you did. Actually. I did. Okay. I definitely did. I had, um, I, I wouldn't, I, she might say I was vindictive. <laughs> but no, if you um, don't mind sharing, because here's the thing, God, like it's really important for me to say this. Some people will stay in that space having this tension, yeah. having this friction for the rest of their lives. The children grow up in a toxic environment. like Not can, healthy. Exactly. So if you don't mind being very honest and taking totally. us through, if you actually were vindictive, because to your point, you even said, five years later, the fact that you guys can all have dinner together is so fucking cool, but I need to know how you got there. Like yeah. the real truth of how the fuck you went from, my husband's had an affair, to now I'm having dinner with a woman. I don't like feeling unresolved about dysfunction in my life forever. There's a period of time where I can sit with something and go, I just need to sit with this for a minute and really process this and not be reactive, but be fully invested in how I feel about it before I respond. It took me a little longer than I cared to, you know, say um, as it comes to this marriage and, and what happened between Jason and I. Um, you know, when it first went down, I was, I was angry. Um, my family was angry and, and I would have, I would have gone so far as to say, he's going to do the same thing to you. I, I, mm -hmm. I truly believed it. And I was very unhealthily tapped into like, I was in a drain and I just kept going down. Um, and in fairness, I think I had to go through that. I had to go through that anger phase. I was vindictive. I was miserably unhappy. Um, it was it was a bizarre time in my life. And then I, I took space from it. I didn't see them for a long time. I didn't communicate with, uh, I, I communicated with my ex-husband as it related to the children and that was kind of it. And I went, well, this isn't, working either for me. I don't like this. I don't like feeling like someone that I spent the better part of half my life with, who I know better than his family and he knows me intimately in that sense. Like I can't live in this space of let's have fake communication about our children and, and keep it moving. And I don't think that he wanted that either. So I started to re-engage as did he. Um, and there was bumps in the road you know, because we had, we didn't have boundaries and we had disconnected mm -hmm. for a while. So the, the going from the anger to the disconnect to the re-engagement, that part was challenging because we had to now have new boundaries. We're not married anymore. How do we define that? Like, I have to have respect for your new relationship. How do I get past that? And once I started recognizing that, that that piece of it was missing, and that's why our dynamic was, the re-engagement was not going as well as either of us wanted it to. That's when I finally said, it's time for me to sit down with wow. your partner. And we picked, you know, we picked a day, and it was like five days and counting, four days, <laughs> 48 hours, you know? Yeah. And I was ready. I really wasn't nervous about it at that oh. point. I was really ready to have like a not angry conversation, but a healthy conversation. And we sat together for three hours. Um, we had some wine, we had some lunch and we just talked. And, you know, she obviously took accountability, um, which I think was nice to hear, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, um, necessarily the most important piece of the puzzle. We spoke about how can we move forward in a healthy way and sort of be the defining moment of how we all envision sort of moving forward um, as a family. And that was something we kind of, we both agreed we wanted to be proud of. Like, wouldn't that be cool if we could be, come from a totally fucked up place and then come full circle and spend holidays together, enjoy each other's company, support each other, um, be there for my children when I can't be. 
um, as their stepmom, all of these things. And that's what we put into the conversation. I said, it's going to take a minute. And she agreed. I said, it's not like all of a sudden we're going to be, you know, under the tree together. And then lo and behold, we were this Christmas, <laughs> Christmas morning, mimosas and, you know, opening presents over at their house. And I had a great time. But we put that out into the universe is how we sort of envisioned. Wouldn't it be fucking cool if we could redefine what this looks like for every family that's been through what we've been through and felt like there's n it's never going to be healthy again. It's going to be screwed up for these kids forever. I really wanted to see if we could do that. And so we're doing it. Fuck, oh, that's such an amazing breakdown. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for taking me through that. And also talk about what you're freaking uh, teaching your daughters to yeah. not be in a relationship if it doesn't work, to not hold on to a grudge, to, to actually go through a grief, but then be able to come out with uh, beauty and dignity and respect at the end. It's so fucking powerful. I have too many people in my life, and I don't know if you do, where they've divorced, 30 years later, they still can't be in the same room with each other. And I have like people in my family that are adults and they're the kids and they're like, oh yeah, shit, mom and dad are gonna be in the same room today because it's my 40th birthday. And it's, yeah. like, it's such a unhealthy way it's to so live. so shitty. And it's so like, again, it goes back to like old traditions and like, oh, you, obviously if you're gonna get divorced, like the, all bets are off. And mm -hmm. why can't we recover properly? Why can't we sort of be in charge of our destiny and what, what post-divorce looks like? Why can't, and I've always wanted to talk about that and and I've been able to talk about it with a lot more honesty mm -hmm. since coming clean about what I really went through and what we both went through as a couple and sort of the recovery of that. Because really the story that was told was I was a workaholic and he couldn't take it anymore. And that was that. Yeah. That's, it's way more complicated and relationships always are. Oh, yeah. And you even use the word recovery. And what's interesting is it wasn't like you were bullshitting recovery. Like, cause what I mean is like, let's just do face for the kids. When the kids are around, we play polite. But That's then, bullshit. It's such bullshit. First of all, kids are the most intuitive creatures on the planet. If you think that you're fooling your kids, you've got it twisted. Mm -hmm. They see it all. They mm -hmm. know everything. They know you walk in and I'm terrible at not wearing my emotions on my sleeve. And even when I've done my very best to fake it, like I am authentic, I, it like b comes out of my pores, right? And, and for the families out there that feel like they've got their kids fooled when they wake up in therapy at 20, when you finally do decide to pull the trigger after years of like a bullshit facade, it's gonna screw those kids up far more mm. than living authentically that you're in an unhealthy relationship that's not working for either one of you and you're choosing to leave it. Mm. That's how you want your kids to be in their relationships. A thousand percent. And even if you don't have kids, how to fully move on mm. if you're holding something to the past. I honestly don't see how you can if you've still got this like wound that you haven't healed. And so um, in healing it, it's not even the pretend heal, right? Or like the passive aggressiveness, right? You could have been so damn passive aggressive and like do these jabs, right? Like we said at the beginning of the interview, you even said about your friend when you do the little jabs. It's like the jabs are the thing that people don't necessarily call you on. The jabs are the things you mm. can probably do for 10 years, right? And nobody, everyone will like feel it, yeah. but no one will actually say anything. But there's no way I could think of you being able to heal. Well, that's the thing. I think, you know, with everything, there's like, the, the what are the five steps? Like you have to grieve. Mm. You have to, it's okay to be angry. Like you got, like the people that are like faking their way through all of those emotions, even as it relates to business, mm -hmm. like it's okay to fail and fall on your face. You should experience that loss as it exactly is and as you're experiencing it. Not push it down the line because that doesn't serve you. Mm -hmm. That doesn't allow you to get back up again and feel stronger. The, I get that question all the time. Like, you know, how did you get the way? I said, because I fell on my face so many times because I did this alone. I didn't really have that many people that I related to that I could look up to. So every time I fell on my face, I did cry and I did scream and I did 
have too many tequilas because I lost the big deal. And I, I did have a lot of things to say about it. But the truth is, by virtue of experiencing that authentically, then I was able to get back up and move on. And I think divorce and going through a breakup or going through any sort of trauma like that is similar. If you don't deal with the symptoms and experience the emotion of the loss and the anger and everything that goes along with it, then how the hell are you gonna be able to move on? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know, Jason and his wife were on the receiving end of, <laughs> of my process. But it's, it's it's brought us to where we are today. So I don't, I wouldn't, I don't think either of them and, and, and myself, I don't think we'd, any of us would take any of it back. All right, so in your growth, and maybe you have, and I'd really be curious to talk about this, in your growth, sometimes like for me, I was the stay-at-home wife, submissive, do things for my husband. And then when I went into business, I went so fucking hardcore the other way that my husband was like, hey, yeah you know like i kind of miss the sweetness in you right and so i realized oh shit i actually have to pull back a bit because what i did is i just went really tough hardcore alpha in every aspect of my life and so because i'd already been married i had this you know dynamic with my husband i actually he was like look i actually really i understand why you have to be hard in business right like you're 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 it's like you're going to war every day. He's like, so I totally get it. But at the same time, what you're doing is you're bringing that harsh, harshness back and you've lost this sweet nurturing side of you that I loved. And I was like, oh, actually, I totally understand what he means. And I did go too hard. Now with you and you saying, you were the one that was looking up to your husband on the pedestal. And over time, as you started to get more powerful, more mm. strong, more badass, more ownership of who you are and where you want to go, and you were chipping away at that stall, and now you weren't looking up to him, but earlier you said about your current boyfriend, mm. where you're basically the hard nut, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I'll use my own words. You're the one that's the boss, the fucking lady, and we're doing this. But also you're looking to him to be like, but hang on a minute, I want you to also handle it. How are you like going to navigate the two of like, you're a fucking badass, but actually you do want people to lead as well. He naturally is a leader. And I think the difference between uh, the younger generations and the 20, I mean, I'm with a 28 year old. Yeah, sorry, I forgot <laughs> to actually give context there. Uh, but I think men in his generation are a little bit different. I think they're inspired by women um, like myself. And I think they're, and that's why, you know, year over year, every single year, you're seeing more and more women in relationships with younger men. So I think there is a different level of confidence that you know, my husband's generation, ex-husband's generation did not have, um, where, again, this comes down to wage gap equality, like each generation is experiencing it differently. Um, and obviously because I'm, I'm my age, you know, the way I grew up, it was just a gap, period, the end. I mean, I was raised in a household where my dad was the boss, my mom was also a boss, but at home. Mm -hmm. And that was very, that was very, very clear and it was very black and white. And I think Eric is a great example of, of being a part of a generation where, you know, you can look up to a, a woman at making money and someone that's successful and be like, go for it. And he's always empowered me and we've been together for three years. And I will say, he knows when I'm falling off the ledge. What do you mean by falling off the ledge? Like whether I'm exhausted because I've worked, you know, four weeks in a row, 80 or 90 hour weeks, and I've been traveling for work and I'm coming home depleted with like nothing left to give mm. are moments where, you know, for example, I came home from a work trip a couple months back and there was a bath run for me, a glass of wine and sushi was already at the house, like waiting. And so I like came in, I got in the tub and I was like, mm -hmm. you know, these are things that, you know, maybe financially he can't, you know, fly me on a private jet to another foreign country and, you know, give me that type of experience. But, but the simplicity in what he is able to give me from an emotional standpoint and from a giving standpoint was so much more actually about me. Mm -hmm. Um, and my well-being than it was about, I'm gonna be showy and take you here, there, and buy you this handbag or send you on this trip. And, you know, to me, that's, it's it's good for my soul. It's, it's what I need in my life to be, to feel balanced. I don't know 
if I would find that in someone my age. That's fascinating. I don't know if you know this, but um, one of the big things in relationships and knowing whether it's going to su succeed or not is if the partner feels seen or not. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally believe that. I mean, I think that's a big part of it. You know, I'm very supportive of his career. Um, he works nonstop. Um, but I think what he brings to my life and in terms of giving back, and I don't think either of us ever thought that this relationship was going to be as what it was. It's blossomed into something that I think neither of us had anticipated. But out of that has come something so beautiful. And, and whether or not it's, you know, till death do you part or however long we make a choice to be together, um, the, those moments are so important. Like he brings me back down to earth and reminds me that I need to sleep. I need to take care of myself. I need to do things that are good for my well-being and my health and my wellness versus, you know, being out in the public eye at the right restaurants and, you know, having the right handbag or any of that shit, which mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I see a lot of people, particularly in LA, that are focused on all of those things. Mm. Did you have to face judgment when you started dating him because he was so much younger than you? Absolutely. How did you deal with that? I told them to eat shit. <laughs> <laughs> True. But yeah, you I did go. Okay. <laughs> I really, I really did not give a fuck. I, I just, I just didn't. And not at all. Even no. people close to you? No. Oh, fuck yeah. No, I really didn't. Because if you know Eric and the people that know me intimately that have an actual relationship with him and made an effort to really get to know him, know who he is. He's a, he's a deep down an incredibly solid human being sometimes more so than you know the men that are my age. And so when you have a foundation like that for like a solid human, um, the people that I said know us intimately are like, he's a good guy. Now, whether or not you guys end up together forever is 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 not the point. You're in a relationship that's much healthier than the relationships you've been in in the past. And we like this for you. You're healthy. You're happy. You've never felt better. You're rested. I'm not going out all the time. I'm I'm more successful. I'm more productive. Like this is because the man in my life is there supporting me and lifting me up and, and also sort of drawing a line saying, I don't really think that you need to like, we need to go out tonight. Mm. Like I think actually it would be nice if we just spent some time alone. And I'm like, okay, great. You know, it's nice to kind of have that and, and sort of be brought back down. Mm. How are you able to build trust back again from your last relationship and now being in this new relationship? Honestly, I, I, uh, that's again a daily sort of stay in your body, try not to go back to the trauma of what that was and trust that if it does happen again, you'll make the decision that's right for you and you won't wait five years to do it, mm. right? Um, I don't think in relationships we can ever fully trust that someone isn't going to do something outside of the bounds of what your agreement is between the two of you. Um, How are you going to trust yourself then to hold true to that? Well, I guess I have to find out, right? <laughs> Hopefully like, you don't, but... Right? But yeah. assuming that I'm presented with that scenario again, there won't be... Uh, um, uh, there won't be second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth chances yeah the reason why i ask is i think that that's something that a lot of people struggle with when they've been cheated on it's like wow i don't trust myself anymore i don't trust myself that i'm going to be able to spot it that i'm going to be able to leave again or that i'm not going to be able to lose myself again I in totally a relationship i totally relate to that on every level i think that any woman or man that's been through that and has been truly betrayed and and really caught off guard um, is a really difficult recovery process to fully trust again. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if I'm 100% there. I don't know if I ever will be, um, but I have to try and I have to give myself to it fully. And the only way to find out if you're capable of it is by virtue of experiencing it. Mm -hmm. I heard you say though that the judgment always came from women. Yeah, you know, um, this is an interesting topic because so for so long, you know, being sort of the feminist that I am, I've looked at men as being the reason uh, that we are not, you know, equal on all fronts. And 
over the course of the last few years, I've done some soul searching on that and just even looking at the women around me, um, women across the board on social media channels. And I've recognized that, you know, the competitive nature between women to get to the top is one piece of the puzzle. And then I also think, again, my generation, the generation in front of me and the generation in front of that generation are all still, everybody's behind their little computer on social media, sitting in the dark, judging. Mm -hmm. I think the, the younger generations are a little bit um, different, uh, but I think women typically are our biggest challenge today. I think there's a, a problem with the way that we all grew up and, and it's very difficult to break out of those patterns because we were raised in that. At, at 47 years old, for me to be who I am every single day and be this feminist, uh, it's like work. I've had to like challenge myself in certain areas and be like, well, why can't? I remember I hired, here's an example. I hired a new agent on my team by the name of Shelby. Shelby I met in Mexico at a, a 50th birthday party. She's 25 or 20, she was 25 or 26 at the time. Gorgeous model, you know, great on social media and Instagram, but a model nonetheless. And a couple years later, she came to me and wanted to sell real estate. Smart girl, totally has the charisma for it. But you know what was the first thing I did? I started saying, well, she's gonna have to like, stop modeling and doing the whole bikini thing mm -hmm. on social media to be taken seriously. And then I was like, no, no. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like I, I did the same fucking thing. And, and by the way, every, you know, the people that surrounded me in business were like, oh, you know, she's really gonna have to reel back on, you know, cause she couldn't possibly be successful in real estate and wear a bikini. Now granted there's, I know you're not gonna wear a bikini to a listing appointment, but perception is everything. And I said, well, then if I'm gonna stand here and say that all of the things that I'm saying about being a feminist and I should be able to wear a half top and, and make you know $10 million a year, then I have to also get behind the women underneath me that are doing the same thing and actually elevate them, support them, and make them into the little bosses that they are. And that's exactly what she's doing. I, I said to her, I even told her, you know, pretty much this story. And I said, there's no reason for you to have two separate accounts. You do you. And, you know, as long as you show up to work and give it 110%, I don't care what perception of you, what the perception of you is online. I care that you know what you're talking about when you walk into the room, that you're connected and that you are ready to talk to this client about their home and how you can best service them. At the end of the day, that's all that matters. And she has that in spades. Now, if she did not have that charisma or that ability to connect, that would be a different story, but she had it. So the one thing that was holding her back was that she was a bikini model, and not just a bikini model, but you know, but there were a lot of, of these pictures of her online. Well, that's bullshit. Why can't she be both? And so I had to really second guess myself and remind myself that I, it doesn't stop right there. And I think that's a big part of where the older generations look at some of, even me. They look at me and say, you, you can't wear that and be successful at the same time. Well, why the hell not? I'm actually currently doing it, you know? And I think that's part of what my new messaging is. It's talking to women about really supporting each other because I think that's kind of like, it's kind of bullshit. Like we say we support each other to a point, but then don't, don't be too feminine. Don't be too comfortable with your own body. You're still a mom. What kind of mom are you if you dress like that? All of these types of comments are completely farcical when it comes to, you know, talking about women online. And, and it, it, it's made, me absolutely bananas crazy. So now it's, it's like all I, I want to focus on and talk about because we can't point the finger at men forever for holding each other back. We have to elevate each other and be able to be all of the things that we are. And that includes boobs and a butt 
and a pair of heels and however we feel like doing our hair and makeup. That's what makes us women. We, have, we are in completely different than men. And we have to celebrate all of those differences, not just how they fit into being an old version of becoming a feminist. I love your energy around this. I feel the same and I don't know how to talk about it because I have a freaking show called Women of Impact. My whole life is dedicated to supporting women, elevating women, helping women. And yet people sometimes still watch this show, homie. And there's mm. people across the sea and they just, in the comments, rip the, the woman apart or rip me apart what the hell's up with this woman's hair or like why does she <clears throat> talk in a squeaky voice um i had one uh, guest who was a doctor she was giving advice on how women can help with their hormones and self-care right so her whole life is dedicated to helping women and their hormones mm. and the comments is because she wore a crop top Literally, story of my life women in the freaking comments oh guys i read the comments i read the freaking <laughs> comments <laughs> In the comments, they were like, I can't take this woman seriously because she's showing her belly. How can she, if she wasn't showing her boobs, I would take her advice more seriously. And I'm like, you're Here's watching- the reason we are totally fucked. Like that is the bottom line. Because at the end of the day, if we're the ones elevating each other and call it 50, per, and, and I'm shooting statistics out without any, so 50% of us are, are really truly elevating women as a whole, but the other 50% are saying, I'm, I'm here to elevate you if you do it the old fashioned way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't, but outside, you sound like you're smart and you have your shit together and you've done all the things and here's the list of all of your accomplishments. I'm here for that so long as you do it the way I say you should do it because traditionally that's the way it was done. Yeah, as long as you do it within my value system. Right. And that's where it's like, it's so damn important for me to keep talking about this sort of thing and even with the show, I try to have as many diverse types of women as I possibly can because here's what I'm not saying. Every woman should go and have business and be a badass and crush it in work. No, no, no. What life do you want and what the hell is holding you back? I got you. That's what the show is about. Right. And so even with what we're talking about today, it's been about relationships, it's been about business, it's been about uh, friendships. But the whole point is how the hell, Tracy Tudor, do you stand up and be a freaking like strong woman on a daily basis when you're getting all this stuff coming at you? Whether this stuff is other women hating on you, whether it's, you know, you finding out that your husband's cheated on you, whatever that stuff is, how the hell do you keep showing up? Because a lot of women don't. You've just shared over an hour, God knows how long, of all the tactics and tips that you do. That's what I want to keep focusing on, right? Hey, you at home, stop writing a comment about, oh my God, I can't believe she dates someone that's 20 years younger. Why do you care? And it's so damn disheartening, girl. It's so damn disheartening to think that because of our own belief system, if it doesn't align with what, you, you know, if what you do doesn't align with my belief system, then I'm only going to tear you down. Why not freaking support? Yeah, I mean, I think what I find is it only inspires me to keep doing it. The haters on you inspires you. It only inspires me to keep having the dialogue keep dressing the way I want to dress, whether that's in a crop top, which I get a lot of shit for, or, uh, you know, wearing a skirt that's, whatever that looks like to the women. If I keep doing it, they will eventually, as long as I'm, <laughs> as long as I'm still speaking um, from the same mindset, as long as I'm still successful, as long as my messaging is no different, eventually they'll kind of go, okay, well, I guess she's as smart as I thought she was. And I guess the, the top that she's wearing is sort of irrelevant, isn't it? And, and mm -hmm. that's sort of my mission to continue to, if I stop doing what I'm doing, then that dialogue isn't had until the next woman that comes along that maybe doesn't have the balls to stand up for themselves quite yet because they're a little bit younger. And so then you're always conforming. And if we don't stand up and not conform to what these old ideals were, then we're never gonna actually f change the whole system. Mm. And so to me, it's always going to be continue, like y'all inspire me. The more you talk shit, the more I'm going to continue to be exactly who I am, 
exactly, say exactly what I'm thinking all of the time and just be 100% authentic. And it seems to be working. So, fuck yeah, girl. And I, um, I don't want to presume, but I do feel like sometimes a lot of the hate just comes from insecurity, right? It's like, I, I wish I had the confidence to dress like that. I wish I had the confidence to just say, yeah, I'm divorced. I'm going to go after a guy who's 20 years younger than me. Like, and so because maybe people don't have the confidence, the, um, the flip side is to actually say why it's wrong because now they don't, you don't necessarily have to. Yeah, I mean, I think we all, we all know that, right? Like, you know, social media trolls, it's, you know, they're all insecure. And that's a very easy way to compartmentalize them, right? And so that we can move on with our day. But the truth is we have to, the, social media is how people communicate. It is a big part of how we're all out there and having success that we're having. And if we don't continue to have the dialogue on how to shift that narrative, then we're not going, we're going to continue to have sort of these internet trolls that actually are valued. There's value there. There's a reason these different blogs and, and social media accounts are created. There's a reason bots are, you know, these are things are successful because people buy into it. And what we don't want to see is people buying into it anymore. So in order, in my opinion, in order to stop that bullshit, we have to keep stepping up, keep stepping out of our comfort zones, continue to battle this in an effective way so that, you know, we change the actual dynamic. We shift their opinion. And more often than not, when I do have a dialogue with a troll for whatever reason, not every time. But more often than not, they'll say, wow, I just never really thought that you would actually respond to this. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not emotionally affected by it either way, but it's more of a shift of, I'd rather connect with you and explain to you that the reason I will continue to do this is so that I can shift your mindset mm -hmm. about it. I'm not here to upset you. I'm here to shift your mindset that I can be many, many things. And those things include sexiness, funny, and really fucking smart at the same time. Like, why can't we have all three? Why if, why, if you're smart and successful as a woman in business, do you have to be one note? I'm over it. Where's that um, fine line between um, helping them, right? Like, actually, I think that if I say this, maybe I'm opening a door that you haven't seen before and defending yourself. I mean, I think in some cases, you know, when, they, when it's tapped into my relationship with my children, um, uh, I'll, I definitely have a little bit of a different messaging messaging surrounding that. But my kids are also old enough to um, have their own minds on social media. And like I said, they're little feminists in the making. And so they can speak quite eloquently um, and in a way that has worked, I think, wonders. Because obviously I can also not be a good mom because I work too hard and I dress too sexy. So therefore I'm setting a bad example for my girls. Both my girls are unbelievably successful in their own right. They're good kids. They get good grades. They're on an incredible path of their own and they're thriving. And they'll chime in when they feel like it on their own. And, and I, I can't tell you the amount of times I've read some of Juliet's responses um, on social media to different people and I'm blown away with what she's been able to say. And I think, you know, so are my followers, candidly. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, this little 17 year old has uh, quite a bit to say and is really effective. I mean, God help everyone when she's 25. You know what I mean? She learned the lessons from her mom. Yeah. But that's the thing. It's like really having the skills to defend yourself in certain moments or having the skill to let something roll off your back. Like if this such, and this is really, you know, beautiful full circle where we started from. I find it even now sometimes difficult for myself. Um, and a lot of it, that's why I'm actually leaning in a lot into health. Because I'm like, if I'm just tired, if I haven't eaten, if I'm overwhelmed, I'm way less likely to let something roll off my back and then like defend myself if someone comes at me, like come at me bro, yeah. right? Like I'm more likely to do that on days that I'm not feeling great and exhausted versus on days that I'm feeling confident because I've had a great sleep, I've had a great day, whatever. Like in those moments, I'm more likely to let it roll off my back. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, because this has now become more recently a mission of mine, I'm conscious of that. So despite 
how I'm feeling that day, I'll really try to shift. I'm beginning a shift in how I how I react to mm. these types of comments because my my bigger goal is to sort of have women realize that by we're holding ourselves back yeah. by doing this to each other. Um, we're our, we should be our biggest advocates, not the reason that we're still not there. Yeah, and even in what you were just saying, it's like, if someone said, I can't take you seriously because you wear heels and you wear low cut tops versus you can't be a good mum because you wear heels and low cut tops. I assume that the impact it has on you to your point of like when it's to my kids, obviously they're older now, but when they were younger, did you have more of that like protection? Like, okay, now you've actually triggered the thing inside me that's not gonna, I can't let this roll off my back. Yeah, of course. I mean, they're my babies and you know, I feel very responsible for, uh, along with Jason for the women that they're becoming and, and you know, when your kids become teenagers, it's like a whole different world. Like you're lucky enough to be graced by their presence. They have ideas of their own. They have their own thoughts. They, you know, you're like old and they have their own vision of how they want their life to be. Now I could either take that and be offended by it, but honestly, I embrace that in them. And so, when they were younger, these types of comments would get at me a little bit more. But now, because they follow me so closely in my business and, and really what I am all about is women empowering other women, they're like my little empowerment chicks. So Scarlett a little bit less so, and again, she's only 14, but Juliet's like 17 going on like 30. <laughs> she's just like, listen, here's how I'm gonna put it to you ladies. And she'll, you know, chime in on her own. And and that sort of affirms that without me having to say it, that the little women that I have raised, I've raised really well. And they're making good decisions. They know how to speak on behalf of themselves. They know how to elevate themselves. And they know how to be heard. Um, and that to me is is the job speaks for itself. I don't have to defend it. Mm, I love that, but because I don't have children, like the mama bear effect is very fascinating to me because every time I hear about pretty much any badass, powerful woman, it's always just like, well, I kind of let things slide off my back. If people are insulting me, if people are doing this to me, like we always kind of let the things go when it's happening to you. But when it happens to someone in your life or someone you really care about, like I can't even remember the stats. I'm going to pull something out of my ass right now, but it's something like 70% of women are more likely to fight for their colleagues' pay raise than their own pay raise. Um, because you're more likely as a woman to advocate for someone else over yourself. What would you suggest if you weren't a mother of like, or in fact, anybody of how we start to actually advocate for ourselves? Sells first. Right. I mean, it's so true. I was watching this Korean new show. You guys got to say it. it's called Glory. Mm. And it's about, it's it's obviously in South Korea, but it, it's about a young girl who was bullied by some high school students and she spends the better part of 20 years coming back for revenge. And it's really good. <laughs> but wow. there's this instinctual thing, I think, that happens with women and I don't know, maybe not for every woman, but for me, since I was a kid, if there is an underdog, I am their protector. If there is someone that isn't getting paid equally, then I'm coming to bat for them. Like, I've just always been that way. And I used to attribute it to just being a woman. And that's part of just like our makeup and who we are. But um, I definitely have not advocated for myself early enough as a young you know, entrepreneur coming into business, mm -hmm. it took me until now to finally start beginning to, you know, advocate for myself in the last, call it, eight years of my career. But the first 15 years of my career, I spent advocating for everyone else. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just the truth. Um, and so, you know, again, the reason why I wrote the book, um, and, the re and you and I had talked about this before, I really wanted young women to connect to it because I didn't have that book or that mentor that I understood or that I related to because, you know, they said fuck every so often. I was like, oh, 
They make mistakes. They're not just polished 100% of the time. They speak with authenticity. I didn't really have anyone to look up to growing up. So I fell on my face 150 times and had to figure out how to get back up and, and become successful. I don't want the 20 somethings of the world to, to have, to go through what I went through. Like we can cut that in half by, you know, talking to each other, supporting each other, advocating for each other and for ourselves, starting, you know, outside of college or even outside of high school, um, rather than when you're 38. It's a little late. Yeah. A little late to the game, you know? Click here to break these nice girl habits, master your confidence, and enter your bad bitch era. The future of if I continue to go down this road, if I gain twice the weight, if I get arrested twice the times, right? If I have twice the bad friends, like what my life looks like, it was unacceptable to me. I don't want to f around anymore.